podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, May 9th, 2021. This is episode 1795. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Nareva. Getting your audio ready for meetings back in the office, Nareva Audio is designed for distancing. It automatically adapts to new room configurations. So you're ready for the new normal and whatever comes next. Learn more at nureva.com slash twit. And by Udacity. Gain in-demand tech skills in as little as three months with Udacity's part-time online tech courses. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 30 days free access to any one of over 60 courses. That's a $399 value. Just enroll by May 31st, 2021. And by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus for 30 days. Download the Audible app and get started with the free trial at audible.com slash techguy or text tech guy to 500 500. Why, well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater. We're going to talk about digital photography. We're going to talk about smartphones. We're going to talk about smart watches. All that jazz. 8888 <laughs> Ask Leo. That's my phone number if you want to talk high tech on this fine Mother's Day. 888 827. 5536, toll free from anywhere in the U.S. Uh, or Canada. Outside that area, you can still reach me, but you've got to uh, uh, use that Skype thing or something like that. Something to let you make a phone call to a landline from the Internet. 8888-ASK-LEO. Website? Yes, we have a website. What kind of tech guy would I be if we didn't have a website? It's, it's a little old and creaky, but it's there. <laughs> And that's techguylabs.com. The most important thing is uh, we have uh, hired the official scribe, James DeRuvo, to write down important notes on the show, including links and products I mentioned and so forth. And that's all put up there on the website so that you don't have to write it down. And it's free. It's open. There's no sign up. It's just there. Divided uh, the entire site, divided show by show. This is episode 1,795. No wonder it's creaky. That's a lot of shows to carry. They're, uh, each show is divided into hours, one, two, and three. Each hour into segments, one, two, three, and four. You can go right to the segment you want. See the answer, see the question. You Even after a couple of days, we put the audio and video up from the show. So you can even see and listen to the show itself. So make a note of that, if you would, techguylabs.com, and I'll see you in there. It's, you know, it's a nice place. Cozy little place we've made at the techguylabs.com. Uh, did you see Elon Musk last night on Saturday Night Live? Wow. <laughs> we'll talk about that with Sam the Car Guy, I guess. It wasn't comedy. Uh, it was weird. Uh, he's a good sport, I guess. <laughs> I tried to watch. I watched about um, 30 seconds and said, no. Got better things to do. Like uh, like uh, play games on my computer. Study finds, this is a 30-year study from Oxford University. 30 years, 430,000 teenagers from the Uni United States and uh, the U.K., answering questionnaires since 1991. Now, there, you know, when you read about scientific studies, you got to consider the methodology and everything. I mean, these, these were self-reporting teens. But the questionnaire was designed to detect indicators for depression, emotional problems. What they wanted to know is, does watching TV, using social media, living on the screen, on the device, does it cause mental health issues? What do you think? 30 years, 430,000 teens. That's a pretty good, you know, study. Pretty good sample, sample size. It's what they call a longitudinal, longitudinal study. The researchers said 
there's no link between the time teens spend on tech devices and mental health problems. No link. Now, there are other reasons kids might not feel good. Uh, there might be a link between pandemic quarantine and depression, but no, those devices... Uh, the researchers said the commonly used argument that social media platforms and devices are harmful to adolescents is not, is not, N-O-T, borne out by the data and research available. Professor Andy Przybylski, a senior author, <laughs> I think I got that right, Przybylski, senior author of the study says it's too early to make any firm conclusions on the relationship between teen tech use and mental health, and certainly way too soon to be making policy or regulation. So they tried. They tried to find a link. And they couldn't do it. Just, you know, uh, it's easy to see teens kind of depressed, sad, especially of the last year, maybe, and blame it on, well, Zoom fatigue. They spent too much time in pandemic, not enough time socializing. They may well be true. This study didn't didn't measure that but i think it's also it's also safe to say that that kid who's spending a lot of time on his uh, on his smartphone is not necessarily harming their mental health they may be harming their their cognitive abilities i don't know there might be other side effects it's i think you know one of the things i've always wanted to be careful to do is just, you know you know the <laughs> in my day <laughs> thing that us olds do we didn't have screens. We were, we went outside and played, and we were happy. Uh, so when there's a new generation and they listen to rock and roll, and growing their hair long, or a new generation and they're spending a lot of time on TikTok or YouTube, I don't assume that that's necessary. It's just it's that's their generation. It's a different thing, and uh, you, you wouldn't want to deprive them of it because I think in that case they would be kind of not acculturated like their peers. They're going to grow up with a group of people who know Pew PewDiePie is and Mr. Beast, and they're not going to know. That would, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't have a consequence, but <laughs> I'm just saying. No evidence that it's bad. Isn't that interesting? Not Kind of counterintuitive. Kind of counterintuitive. Not something I would have thought. What do you think? 8888 Ask Leo. I'm sure we all have anecdotal stories. I do of uh, teens who spent a lot of time playing video games in their formative years and ended up being nerds. <laughs> I, uh, I know a few of them. <clears throat> not, not me. Me? What are you looking at me for? A crossword puzzle has beaten the best humans. No, no, wait a minute. A computer <laughs> has beaten the best humans at crossword puzzles. There, that's it. I said that right. Dr. Phil, F-I-L-L, -L, has been competing in crossword puzzle tournaments since the year 2012. He's gotten better and better. He just, or it, it, I guess it, just won the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. 1,000 participants. First place. It's the first time an AI has managed to outscore human solvers in speed and accuracy. Dr. Phil, P, not P, F. Dr. F-I-L-L. Does he get it? He filled in the crime. I didn't think it would be that hard. I thought, you know, if you have every word in the English language, every possible answer, how hard could it be? But the questions are tricky in these. Computers first beat everybody at checkers, then backgammon. Well, that wasn't so hard. Then chess. Well, that's impressive. And then go, which was really impressive. Computers can beat people at poker. That's hard because can, yeah, can you read emotions? I don't know. Now, crossword puzzles. Oh, my goodness. First it was Jeopardy. Now it's crossword puzzles. It's hard to do. Hard to do because the, the clues, they're very, you know, they're kind of, they're puns. They're hu very human. You know, that's what's fun about them. About, uh, oh, I don't know, four years ago, uh... 2015, so that was like six years ago. Yeah. Six years ago, a malicious program was discovered on the App Store. It turned out it was more than one program using an exploit 
uh, that was designed to take over those phones and allow people, probably the Chinese government, I'm thinking, to, uh, to spy on people. It ended up being uh, all over the App Store, um, 4,000 malicious apps. Uh, now, this all came out in the Epic versus Apple battle. This is a problem with these court, with these lawsuits. You get discovery, and sometimes companies, something's revealed that they wish they, they hadn't. I think Apple probably wished this wasn't the case. Apple managers, by uh, September 21st, 2015, had found 2,500 of these apps that had been downloaded 203 million times by 128 million users, mostly in China. About 18 million users in the U.S. Apple debated whether to notify all 128 million users and decided not to. They decided not to because different languages, it would, you know, it can be hard. We got to name the apps. So it's too hard. We're just not going to say anything about it. We did find out about it. It was called Xcode Ghost, the tool. And it inserted malicious code if you used it to build your app. It was widely used in China. That's why it was so widely downloaded in China. And I'm going to guess it was the Chinese government that wanted to spy on people. But may, who knows? Don't know. We don't really know. Um, the come on was this downloads faster in China, this Xcode goes. So use this to build your apps. A lot of 4,500 developers did. 128 million people downloaded it. Apple decided, gosh, too much trouble to send out emails to 100. They talked about it, and this is how we know. There were email back and forth. Uh, they Eventually, they pulled all the apps down. I guess that's better than nothing. But they didn't tell anybody. <gasps> Shocking. Shocking. There you have it. That's the news across the nation. The tech news, everything, well, not everything, mostly what you need to know. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number if you want to talk high tech. Are teens affected by too much screen use? Boy, it sure feels like they are, but this study, very good study, says, no, not really. Not really. Hello, Kim Sheffer, phone angel. She's the woman who answers the phone, so pick up the phone and dial our number, 8888-ASK-LEO. And she'll never give you up, never going to let you never, down. Never going to. Never going to. Rick roll you either. <laughs> so, how are you? That is a song from my youth. Did um, you do I'm, something nice for Mama? Uh, not yet. I'm well, here. Well, you're <laughs> so, working. Me too. So Me too. I will go and uh, procure the treats. Procure, <laughs> procure the, the treats. Procure the treats and and lovey things for her Aww. when I'm done it with this. Aww. Let the treats be procured. The yes. Good How about idea. you? Did you do anything? Did you send mom a sent, new iPad or something? I sent mom a text saying, Happy <laughs> Mother's right. Day. And that was about it. There you go. You know, I don't, I, I, I send her stuff all the time. I sent her last week, I sent her a popcorn popper. So I figure oh. I'm covered. Okay. I should send her flowers, shouldn't I? It's probably too um, late. Well, it's too late. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a flower shortage this year. Along Is there with really? Everything else. Oh, my they gosh. They said you needed to order those early. Oh, man. I can't but believe it. I'm going to try and get some today. I didn't yeah. want to get them early because yeah. then they'd be dead on the day. So. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I have to find something. Who? Is there a mother on the line I should talk I to? I don't have any females on no the mothers. line. So, well, they're all um, mothers, I'm sure. Yeah. Let's go to Jeremy <laughs> on line one. If you don't have a mother, Austin, if you're not a mother, you have one. Yes. Well, hopefully you did at one time. At one point, certainly. Thank you, uh, Kim. Hello, Jeremy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hey. Uh, first of all, thank you for your show. Thanks for listening. Uh, I appreciate it. What can I do for you? Yeah, I I have a son. He lives with his, with his uh, mom in over in the UK, over the ocean. Yep. Uh, he's a smart kid. I was looking for something to, uh, you know, he enjoys logical, uh, puzzles and, and such things. Oh, fun. Um, yeah, I, I was looking for something that we could do together over the internet. Had, had, had we been, you know, had physical contact, we could sit Aww. together. Oh, that's sweet. And how, how old is he? He's, uh, seven. Seven is pretty little. Yeah. Um, 
There is a game. Does he have a PC? Yeah. There's a computer and you do too. There is a fun networking game that uh, father and child couldn't do together. That's a puzzle game. I, I think Seven might be a little young, but if you do it together, he might kind of have fun with it. It's called Factorio. Yeah. F-A-C-T-O-R-I-O. And you uh, you build little things, but you can do it together, which is fun. Uh, now, you can't vocalize together, but you could get something like Discoid running in the background. That's what most people do. It's multiplayer. And you have to cooperate. So you can say, okay, son, let's go gather some you know, resources and, and see if we can get this factory back online. It's a puzzle, though. So you said he likes puzzles. So that might be one thing uh, to do, which is kind of fun. Uh, yeah, when I started looking for something like this, I went to Brilliant, uh, so it doesn't it doesn't have any. No, like there's that. no Brilliant's neat, but I think it, it's really more more for adults. Brilliant's great. Yeah. I love Brilliant, and when he is probably in eighth grade, that would be a wonderful gift yeah. because uh, it's basically don't tell him, but it's school. But uh, it, the idea is you, you get smarter by doing it. It's actually pretty difficult. Uh, but I like Brilliant. Uh, the thing is playing it. So what do you mean by playing it together? Would you mean, I mean, you can also do things like Words with Friends, uh, which is a Scrabble game you could play against each other. I think, uh, you know. I currently do. Oh, good. I do it. Not, not, not necessarily a game. I, I look for uh, pictures, uh, you know, puzzling pictures. Um, interesting stuff to solve. Yeah, oh, that's sweet. Um, I must break your heart that he's so far away. That's got to be very hard. Yeah, it I'm is. sorry. Um, you know, another thing you might want to do, if you're a little bit techie, is set up a Minecraft server, and you two can play Minecraft together. He's right about the age where Minecraft's just going to be his thing. Minecraft doesn't require a very heavy-duty PC. Run, you can run a Minecraft server on a Raspberry Pi. It's not hard to set up. Uh, in fact, um, there is a great book about learning Python, the programming language, using Minecraft and a Raspberry Pi. And, y you know, you would, you could, it's called Python. Let me see. What is the name? Oh, I can't remember the name. Teach Python with Minecraft Pi? That's not it. There's a great... I'll find the book. I, I, I've I actually went through it. And it's fun because uh, the first thing you do is write a program to make a bridge out of dynamite and then blow it up. Kind of thing a seven-year-old would dig. And you can both be in the Minecraft game at the same time. Again, you won't have an audio channel. You could just use the phone for that or something. But uh, but you can see each other and you can do stuff together. I've, I've done that with my kid and it's really... That's a lot of fun. And seven years old is right about the age where Minecraft is uh, is pretty exciting. Does he have a Nintendo Switch? Because you could also do that. No, he has a Mac and an iPad. Okay, yeah, Minecraft might be better. I know a lot of, um, f mostly mothers and daughters rather than fathers and sons, who play Animal Crossing together on the Nintendo Switch. You can go over a visitor island, you can do things together. I think this is going to be very popular on this Mother's Day. That's a great question. We come up with more for you. Stay tuned. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What a what a, I love that question. Things you could do together. What are some other things, chat room, that you would do together? Minecraft, I think, is really fun. Seven-year-old is pretty he's pretty young. So, but I think if dad's doing it with him, it makes it really cool. Has he ever played Minecraft? Do you know? Uh no, yeah. Yeah. I bet he would love that. It plays just fine on a Mac. You would have to run a server that he would log into. That might be the hardest point. But once you're in there... Oh, I can set that up. Yeah. No problem. Raspberry Pi doesn't need much, just the two of you. Um, and then you can build things together. Um, what is the book? Can, I, can, can this thing be run in a VM? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, it's called Learn to Program with Minecraft is the name of the book from No Starch Press. The reason I mention that is it comes with a download for a Minecraft server. It's how I learned how to do a Minecraft server that you can set up. And it's a Minecraft server that has the the um, plug-in to make make it programmable with Python. So you could it'd be fun for you. Do you program at all, Jeremy? No. 
Not not a geek yet. Sounds like you're a little bit of a geek if you're running it in a VM. So uh, no programming. Yeah. Well, it, maybe the two of you could learn together. But it is. I think Minecraft yeah. is so fun, and it's just fun to mess around. It's the kind of thing you're like in a. It's a sandbox that he would love. It's a pro age appropriate for him. Factorio is probably for a little later. The Minecraft. And messing around is the point. Yeah, and you're messing around. And you and if you're on the phone with each other or on Discord or WhatsApp or whatever and you can hear each other, you can say, Hey, what's that over there? Let's go or let's go build something and stuff like that. And I think I think I think Minecraft might be the perfect thing. That sounds like the, the thing I'm looking for. Nice, Jeremy. What a I think you're a great dad. I think that's a wonderful idea. Because you'll have experiences together, even though you're very far apart. Um, that sounds really sweet. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Yeah, well, happy Father's much. Day in advance. Sounds like you're a great dad. Take care, Jeremy. In advance. Bye-bye. The Tech Guy Podcast brought to you today by Nureva. This is such a good solution as we go back to work for your conference room, for your microphones and sound system. You know, even when we go back to work, the way we meet is going to change. Distancing is going to still be here, and it's going to have big implications for the audio in your meeting rooms. You're going to have to change your room configuration. That old centralized microphone is not going to work with people sitting six feet apart, facing in different directions. You need good mic coverage, and Noreva is an amazing patented technology that makes it possible. Now, it's not, it's not a beamforming system. Beamforming systems need adjustment, usually by an expensive technician. If you've got a tabletop system with individual mics in each location, that's fine, but you've got to sanitize them in between meetings. And in every case, you're going to have to have your participants change their behavior, sit a certain way at a certain spot, in a, facing a certain direction. If you're wishing for a better way to get clear, reliable audio and still let your team be safe and act naturally, you need Noreva. One analyst called Noreva Audio, the first socially distanced mic system. It uses a completely original approach to audio conferencing. It's patented. Four patents. They call it microphone mist technology. I'll give you an example. The HTL 300, they have a variety of different systems. The 300 becomes the first microphone and speaker bar to be certified for those extra large spaces. 15 feet by 28 feet. That's four and a half by eight and a half meters. It's big. What it does, basically, all the Nureva systems do is fill the room with thousands of virtual microphones using computer technology. The audio automatically adapts to any room configuration. Even if you're distanced, even if you're facing in different directions, Nureva can handle it. You'll get true full room coverage so people can be heard from anywhere in the room, no matter where they're sitting, no matter where they're facing, no matter how they're distanced. And you don't have to bring in a technician. With Nareva Audio, it's easy to install every microphone and speaker bar on the wall by yourself. I've done it. You can do it. You just, you know, put it in the wall. That's it. It automatically configures itself. Nareva Console puts device management into your hands and on your terms. Adjust settings, install firmware updates, check device status and more, all from a secure cloud-based platform. And, of course, consoles included with every Nureva audio system. As soon as you enroll your system, you'll re receive an extra year of warranty absolutely free. So many awards for Nureva's audio products, including the Top New Technology Award at ISE 2020 for the Nureva HDL 200 system. But no matter how big or small your room is, they have a full line of systems to fit your space. Just check with happy customers. There's lots of testimonials on the uh, Nureva page like HubSpot's principal collaboration engineer, Jimmy Yan. He said, we were so impressed with the sound quality, the ease of install, the ease of use of the HDL 300. It was just a no-brainer for us to adopt it. To learn more about how Nureva Audio is the simple and cost-effective way to get your teams distancing in meetings and still act and converse naturally, visit Nureva.com slash twit. That's N-U-R-E-V-A, Nureva, N-U-R-E-V-A dot com slash twit. Twit. It's designed for distancing. We thank Nareva for supporting the Tech Guy podcast. Thank you for supporting us by using that address, nareva.com slash twit. Now back to the show. It's time for Sam Abul Samet. He is our car guy, principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights, and the host of the Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media. Hello, Sam. Hello, Leo. How are you today? I'm good. Why is it electric cars and hybrids 
you sit in front of one, they all look like a, to me, like a martini olive. They're just that, <laughs> I don't know why. They don't, all, they don't all look like that. I mean, you own one that doesn't look no, like an olive. No, but in the early days, the a lot of them did. Uh, what is that? Is that, I see the chevrons well, on it. That looks like it might be a citroën. It, it is, in fact, a citroën, um, which is, uh, for those uh, not, not old enough to remember, is a French car brand um, that was owned by PSA, the parent company with Peugeot, uh, which recently merged with FCA, which is formerly Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, and now they all comprise what is called Stellantis. And it's a massive, um, massive car company now. Yeah, they have 14 different brands around wow. the world. Wow. Um, and um, one of the businesses that PSA started a few years back in Europe and is now expanding to North America is a, a mobility services business called Free to Move. Um, and <clears throat> in various places, they have a variety of different services. Some places they've got car sharing, ride hailing. Um, they also have an app where they've aggregated multiple services within a single interface. So you can see what's available from car sharing or ride hail or, um, you know, other, other, other options, tra uh, transit options. And here uh, they've, they've launched the Free to Move service as a car sharing service in Washington, D.C. Mm. and in Portland, Oregon. Oh, and uh, they are about to start an experiment, a six-month pilot. So it's like uh, Zap Car, and uh, there's some other Zipcar, other Zip car, yeah. yeah. Where you, yeah, so short-term rentals. You do it on your app. You go to a parking lot in, in your town, and you just get in a car and drive off, and then put it back yep. when you're done. Yep. And uh, so people who live in cities love these, like Zip Car, because you don't want to own a car in the city. No, if you're in a dense urban environment, owning a car can be a real hassle because you've got to find a place to park it and everything. It can that can get very expensive. In a place like Manhattan, you can spend you know a thousand dollars a month or more yeah. just for parking yeah. for a car if you live. And in you Manhattan. don't need it all so, the time. You can always take mass no. transit. So it's nice to have that. So is this the car they're they're going to offer with this service? This is this this is one of the cars that they're offering. It, it doesn't. Uh, they said uh, they're doing a pilot. It doesn't. It's very small. It reminds me of that old. Was it a Citroen that had the the door was the steering wheel was on the door and you got out? In the uh, front? No, that was a BMW. That was the, the BMW Isetta from the 1950s. Oh yeah, the Isetta. But, yeah, it looks but it like is, that. But it is very similar, yeah. you know, in, in terms of kind of that sort of bubbly shape. Uh, it's the a doors are on the the doors are on the side. I'm happy to say. Yes, but it doesn't. Yes. Is it unsafe? Because there's no crumple zones. It feels like if you had an accident in that, you would you'd have to be low speed. Yeah, well, the low speed is about all you're going to have in this because it has a top speed of 28 miles per hour. Oh, okay. Uh, That's safe. Uh, That's good. Yeah, and a range, range of about 45 miles. Uh, it only has eight horsepower. Uh, so it falls into what's known as the uh, neighborhood electric vehicle or low speed electric vehicle class. Oh. Uh, so it doesn't have to meet the same crash standards as full speed vehicles. And, it, you know, it's designed, it, it's mainly being used for these sorts of mobility services because it's very, got a very small footprint, you know, so it's easy to find places to park it. Um, you know, with that, you know, 28 mile an hour top speed, uh, you know, in a lot of urban environments, you're never going to hit 28 miles an hour anyway, especially yeah. someplace like DC. Oh no. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. in the, in the pre-pandemic So you're not supposed times, to get on the highway on this at all. You just. No, no you, yeah. you definitely cannot drive on the yeah. highway. Yeah. <laughs> you would be, and, and, you would be a joke. Somebody in the, uh, <laughs> Twisted Mister in the chat room says, it's not a car, it's a lawnmower. But I yeah. have to say, uh, Citroën used to sell a, a car with two horsepower, the famous yep. Deux Chevaux, and uh, exactly. it's quite popular. So what is this? What is this called? This is called the Ami. Oh, like uh, a friend. French in friend, friend in French. Yep, Ami. Yep, Mi am mon Citroën ami. ami, mon Citroën Ami. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so, can you buy it so yourself, or do you have to rent it? Uh, you can in Europe. Uh, you cannot buy it here. Um, here it's basically a golf it for the, cart. For the car sharing service. It's a golf yeah. cart. Let's face it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They, they haven't announced pricing yet for, you know, for what the rentals will cost. Um, but, it, you know, it, it should be fairly affordable. It's electric. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how the adoption rate is because... Uh, 
car sharing services like like Zipcar and and uh, uh, BMW's former uh, Drive Now program and and Car to Go from Daimler, um, they've kind of struggled a bit here in the well, actually in, in most markets, just they've struggled to actually make money to be profitable, um, just because of challenges with utilization, the cost of logistics to move the cars around, especially if you have a free floating system. So it's it, it can be a challenge to make a business out of it, which is why they're just piloting this program right now to see if they can make it make it commercially viable. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, yeah. if you lived in a city, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no car. You couldn't even go grocery shopping, it looks like, in this thing. It's so small. Uh, no, you, you could. I mean, if you're going by yourself, I mean, it's, it's a two-seater. You know, there, <laughs> there, there should be enough room in there to stick a few bags of groceries on the passenger side. It's pretty limited. It's really for going yeah. somewhere probably more than anything else. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you don't want to grab an Uber or Lyft, right. um, you know, you want to go on your on your own. This is this is an interesting alternative. Do these uh, uh, rental car s services fail because people are so hard on the cars that it's too expensive for them to make money? Is that the problem? Because I would that's what um, I would worry about. Like the the people leave the cars lying around, like they did with scooters. Remember that? That was a real it's, plague it's, in American that, cities. Yeah, that's that's less that's less of a problem with the car sharing. Okay. You know the the, the challenge with the car sharing. You know the the first ones were you'd return you'd have to return the car back to where you picked it up from. Right. So you know that put limits on what you could do with it. Right. Um, you know if you if you had a one way trip. It's a round trip. To, yeah. Yeah, they started doing free floating car share, oh. um, which you know gives more flexibility to the users. But then now, you may end up with cars scattered around the city in places where maybe there isn't somebody else that wants to pick it up and drive it back to where it started from. And so you have to have staff to go around and reposition the cars at various times during the day. Plus, people you, you need staff to go out and, and fuel or charge the cars and clean them. Uh, so it's just general maintenance and logistics got, got to be very expensive. And trying to find the price point that was appealing to, to customers, but still you know, made enough to, to cover the overhead was, was a bit difficult. And we'll see if with this one, because it's such a small, inexpensive vehicle and it's electric, so its operating costs are going to be low, whether they can make a go of it or not. Right. Did pandemic kill the uh, e-scooter revolution? I remember there were limes Actually, everywhere. And uh, I mean, yeah, you, it, couldn't walk, you couldn't walk three steps in Santa Monica without tripping over a electric scooter. Yeah, no, it, it's actually it's actually been doing better. Um, okay. You know, there's been sh some shakeout in the business. A bunch of the companies kind of pulled back, um, you know, so there's not quite so many competitors anymore. Uh, and they, the companies that are operating these have also shifted to new scooter designs that are more robust. You know, the original ones were, you know, kind of consumer <laughs> scooters. You know, they were cheap, yeah. off-the-shelf ones you could buy out of, from various suppliers in China. They didn't last very long. No. Now they're shifting to to more ruggedly built ones yeah. that are going to last longer. They're doing things like um, uh, swappable batteries, uh, so that you don't you know you don't have to have somebody going around picking they them up. They used to have to drive around at night, to, put them in a truck, bring them somewhere, and charge them. It's crazy. Yeah, and crazy. so that was a that was a huge cost. So now with the swappable batteries, you know you could just take the battery out, go plug it in, um, you know, or swap the batteries right. around. It's it's a lot more cost effective. We're so you know what's great is, make is there's creativity going on in transportation, mm -hmm. and we need that, and uh, and I'm all for it. You know the idea of uh, personal ownership of cars is kind of wasteful. You you're only in your car 10 percent of the day at most. You yeah, know, at most. Sam Abul Samad, find him at Guidehouse Insights and his great Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media. Of course, here every week. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Leo. Bye. I think e-bikes. I'm a I'm a fan of e-bikes. I think I think that's the that's yeah. The no, e-bikes e are great too. Um, you know, they're and and the, that's something that some of the uh, the micro mobility companies are getting into is e-bikes. Again, you know, the swappable batteries are something that helps um, because you you can you know you can have somebody go around and swap the batteries out. You know, you, you don't have to charge. You don't have to find some place to plug in the whole bike. Uh, so there's it, it gives more flexibility. It's interesting. Yeah, I'd forgotten about all of, all of those scooter things. Sam, have a wonderful day. Are you doing you something too, for Leo. Mother's Day? 
Uh, nope, I'm just going to go uh, try and rest my injured arm. Um, what happened? Oh, the, what happened to your arm? Just, I, I overworked it, I think, last week in the yard. And uh, so I think I may have either had a slight muscle tear or, or uh, a strain or sprain. And uh, it's causing me some discomfort. Gosh, I'm sore too, but it was from lifting weights. <laughs> like a real man. <laughs> I, I was just shoveling dirt. <laughs> Actually, that's the real workout, shoveling dirt, shoveling anything. Uh, All right, Sam, have a wonderful uh, Mother's Day, and uh, we'll see you, you too, Leo, and, next and give my best to Lisa. I will. I will. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you're having a wonderful Mother's Day, treating that mom of yours to something special. Henry on the line from Los Angeles. Hi, Henry. Oh, I'm actually from Las Vegas. I moved. You know? <laughs> from Vegas. Viva yeah. Las Vegas. Hey, Henry. All right. So I've been tearing out my hair. I went on this uh, over COVID. Let's build some new flashy PCs. Oh, fun. And, uh, that was a big I, thing. I bought, yeah. Yeah. You know, I went and bought two motherboards just to race and compare them. A socket STRX4 and a uh, Asus. These are both Asus, by the way. Uh, Formula 8. Uh, Crosshair Formula 8, and uh, I'm having um, a heck of a problem with the AM4 Formula 8. And uh, I was in the chat, and a lot of people are saying a lot of people have problems. Oh, I saw your paste. You pasted in the uh, the tail yeah. of two motherboards. The tail of two motherboards. So they're in a little race, and the, the, the older boy that cost more, believe it or not, by 100 bucks, basically, um, is giving me mad problems when I boot up. I bought uh, an EVGA. <laughs> this is, uh, by the way, EPX. this is exactly yeah. the kind of call that everybody who says, oh, you do a computer show on the radio, thinks that, that that's what you know, we talk. Yeah. <laughs> this is exactly this is exactly what every programmer, director, and every radio station that carries this show says when we say, hey, how'd you like to take the Tech Guy show? I don't want to hear Henry come in with his motherboard issues. But you know what? Because I love you, Henry. I'm going to do my best, but I can't promise you okay. anything. No, I, I do like the uh, ROG stuff, by the way, but I've never bought just a motherboard. I have We have an ROG uh, complete system. And this is the problem, of course, with building your own computer, is all those all those parts, who are you going to go to if something doesn't work, right? Yeah. So I'm dealing with the clues right now. The GTX Titan, when I put in the, the uh, display port... Uh, you know, cable and the HDMI cable, I can never get it to boot on DisplayPort. And I I can now, with these new motherboards, look at the OLED display and see. Oh, that's the nice. Code. So the motherboard has a little little display on it that tells you what's going on. Code. Instead of those, but, they used to do beeps. It used to say, yeah, hey, it used you know. to be the beeps from heck. Yeah. R2D2 time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I actually melted down two Pentium 3s, double. CPU Pentium 3s that way, and it makes a horrible... Oh, oh, that's, that is not good. <laughs> that's not the sound you want to hear. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to get it to boot to the display port, and I'm having to do this switchboard operator thing. Boot to Windows 10 with the HDMI, pull out the HDMI, put in the DVI cable, and I, I can see the motherboard code. It's like code 8. And, you, um, that is bizarre that, uh, it, it, you know, eventually it will work, uh, but it won't boot. Like why would it, why would one v particular display cable keep it from booting and the other not? And you don't have a discrete graphics card. You're using the graphics on the motherboard? Um, no, I'm using a discrete card. What's the card? Uh, a GTX Titan Black. Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. Picture. Try it. Uh, the motherboard has its own video, right? Uh, no, no, I don't think it does. Oh, I don't, I don't think really. Yeah. No, this really is a gaming yeah. system. That's why. W would it, would it be some sort of maybe a BIOS flash? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I, well, this is, second, you're on your own, buddy. I can't. <laughs> a second thing that I, that I have. I'll, I'll think, I'll tell you a couple of things I would try. First of all, try a different display port cable. I actually just the okay. other day had a display port cable with a short in it that froze up the display. Uh, and I couldn't figure out why is the display stopped responding and it was a cable and I threw that cable out. So first thing I would do is see if you get another cable. Well, okay. Because um, I can't, it's hard to think of why a video display choice 
you know, a cable that you've got plugged in would st keep something from booting unless there's something wrong with the cable. That, you know, that would be the first thing I'd look at. Display port is unfortunate. It's not a question of, and, and as people in the chat room are saying, you know, you can you can tell in the BIOS which to boot to first, but it's not a question of that. It won't boot if the display port's plugged in. That's weird. But I'm afraid this is uh, this is way too geeky for me. <laughs> uh, if I were if I were if I if you had a beer and I could come over to your place, we could sit down, we could work on it, maybe. But I don't think I can help you on the on the radio. Sorry. Sam in Los Angeles. Hello, Sam. Hey, Hi, Sam. Lee Laporte. How are you? How I'm are great. You? Welcome to the show, Sam. Yeah, nice to finally uh, finally chat with you, man. You um, you're a you're, you're a pretty popular guy on on these uh, on these weekends here. A lot of people want to talk to me. I don't know why. I'm not much help, but I'll do my best. What's well, going you, on? I, well, word on the street is you're the uh, you know you're the guy with the answers. And yeah, uh, well, I have answers. Yeah. They may not be the answer you're looking for. What's your problem? Yeah, well, ho hopefully you got some answers for me, Leo. So um, I'm a I'm a, I'm a screenwriter, and um, I, I I finished a few months ago um, a script I've been working on for about a year. How exciting! My, my 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 computer was stolen. I had it backed up to my computer, oh. but then I but 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 then but then I also had it backed up to my email. Hallelujah! And yeah, but guess what? So I I cannot for the life of me get back into my email oh, account. Oh no! Oh no! Now, now, so is this the only copy of the script that's in your email account? That's it. That's oh it. man! Yep. So um so this is the thing. So it's not that my my password is incorrect because. I, I've had this email account for 10 years. Um, I know the security question. I know every piece of information you can possibly imagine. And it's not written down anywhere. So even though the people stole my computer, they didn't have access to my email. That's good. Um, so, so, what, so you're what, saying that the password changed after your laptop got stolen? No. So, so when I log in, it's asking me what, yeah, so it's asking me what my password is. And I've logged in with my password, um, and my password is totally fine. Um, but it's telling me it is telling me incorrect password. But it's impossible for someone to have changed it because it was only ever written in my mind, right? No, um, no, then, wait, then, no. That doesn't mean it's not possible for them to have guessed it somehow, or reset it. I don't know. I mean, it's it's really difficult because it's, who's uh, the G it's who's the, is it Gmail? It is. It is Gmail. Okay. But but this is the thing, Leo. This is the thing. So so sometimes what what Gmail will tell me is your password is fine. So it will actually accept my password. Okay. And then it, and then but then it will ask me for my security question, which is which is no problem at all, right? Okay. And then I I, I answer the security question, and then it says, okay, great, everything is fine. What's your name? And then it'll ask me to type in my name as it as such as in my email. So I type that in there and it says there is no person with this name. It's, it's really, I've never strange. seen this at all. Um, that I don't, that's bizarre. Uh, maybe this is a password recovery system that Google has. I've never been asked my name, uh, ever. So I'm wondering what's going on with, uh, your system. Um, I would I would go to a clean system, a friend system, something like that, and uh, do. Did you now? Here's the thing with with Google: you got to set up a recovery phone number or a secondary email address. If you've got that, you can easily recover. If you don't, you're gonna now you have to depend on the kindness of strangers and get Google to fix it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I just, it's a very bizarre behavior that it says, what's your real name? I've never heard of that. You're sure yeah, you're, I'm, I'm a yeah, little concerned about what you're doing here. I don't, I don't understand. It shouldn't. Yeah, so it'll, it'll ask me, it'll ask me my name, you know, my first and my last name. And then, and then I'll type it in and it'll say there is, so it's just one of, it's one of Google's security features that they'll ask in the event that if they have a question about, you know, if you are the proper person to sign in, I guess it's a relatively new feature. Okay. That's what I've read on all these okay. different blogs. Okay. So, so people do say Google does this. Okay. Yeah, and so and so I was wondering. Um, I guess ultimately, Leo, how, is 
is there a way that I could hire an agency or contact Google or somebody to help me get back into my account? Because I, I can't do it. Did you have another device that you'd logged into Gmail before, like a phone? Yep, I have. And then and then I logged into that. And a lot of these, like um, on Google's help pages, it'll say, you know, don't panic. Just go ahead and log in from a familiar device. Right. In, in the same exact Wi-Fi. Yeah, and you know, what happened? In area. Yeah. Nothing. So sometimes sometimes it will accept. It, it, it'll literally accept my password and allow me to proceed. And then it'll ask me, what is my security question? And again, I'll answer it. And um, then it'll ask me my name and I'll say there is no person with such name. It's so frustrating. I don't know. I don't know what to do. <sighs> yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on is the problem. Um, it sounds like the people who got your laptop might have messed with your system. OK. Um, so. So the password work there, by the way, the, to answer your question, I don't know of anybody who will do this as a service, uh, okay. but I don't think, I think you can do it. You, you can probably do everything you need to do. Okay. Cause I've there is a, um, several times and, and I, and I get it. Have you, have you looked at the secure a hacked or compromised Google account help page? There is one for that. Mm, I have. Okay, and I you've taken those steps. You, did you have so? Did you have a backup email, phone number uh, associated with the account? Unfortunately, no. No. But guess okay. what, Leo? You, you know what I did have is I had an awesome, awesome security question, right? But that doesn't matter. I I I can answer that question six ways from Sunday, and Google still will not let me in. Yeah. So for future reference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gonna, I'm going to okay. help you, but for everybody listening, for future reference, always set up that recovery phone number, recovery email address. It's a different one from your Gmail address, and always use two factor uh, because two factor will have stopped would have stopped these guys. Something's going on. So you didn't have a problem with this Gmail account until it got stolen. I'm sorry. Say again. Did you have a problem with this account before your laptop got stolen? Mm -hmm. No. Ne never, never. And, and also, I, I was also able to log into my email even um, after my computer got stolen. And then what had happened was I just, just from what I can, what I've been able to, to deduce by what it could possibly be is people are saying that if you go sometimes like several weeks or a month or so and not log in, Google will can they have the option to just automatically lock you out of your account. Which yeah, that, I think, might, that might well happen. So you hadn't logged in in a long time. I hadn't logged in in a fairly long time, and I was just thinking like, well, you know, it's all good. I have it backed up. Let me log in. Um, and then when I logged in, again, you know, it's just giving me all these crazy problems. And I've tried to reach out to Google, Leo. You know, There's I'm, nobody home at Google, as you have figured no, out. No. But they, no the free, no. free Gmail does not really come with any support. No, you're right. We had a caller call me and said, I went to the Google's office and banged on the door, but they wouldn't help me. No. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, hey, I'm not beyond it. I mean, I might have to take, take a trip to the Googleplex. And they won't help you. you. <laughs> um, oh. Golly. Golly. I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out. So you use your real name and they said, we don't know that. You, and you've tried all the variations on your real name and all that stuff, right? Yep, that's right. I don't know what's going on, to be honest. So your password works sometimes. Google, by the way, keeps keeps track of previous passwords. So it might work because they say, oh, yeah, that's his old password. Mm -hmm. And then they ask you the security question anyway? Yeah, they'll ask me the security question. I'll answer it. And um, there, and I'll tell you this: there, there is no way that any human being on Earth has the answer to that security question. That I know for sure. And so, when I answer it, it allows me to proceed, and then it does the funky name thing again. Well, Google is not is has decided that knowing the security question is not enough. It wants more. They, I would guess, the thieves mess with your account. All right. So, what do you suggest I do? 
I'm trying to think of, you know, you've, you've looked through the various ways of recovering a compromised account, right? Because they do have a way of doing that. It's complicated. Like you have to do things like, when did you create your Google Gmail account? And tell me three people you recently emailed. You did all that stuff? You know, you know, I, I I've done all that stuff. I mean, I actually dedicated several weeks, aye, of, aye, yeah, aye. multiple hours a day doing doing this, almost like a part time job. I, I unless I'm I don't blame you if it's your only copy of the script. I don't blame you at all. Yeah, you know, um, I I have heard of like some influencers, some some like y younger it's, younger kids that are that they've reached out through um, like Twitter, and I guess Twitter might have you know, a customer service section that might help them get back into their accounts. Have you heard of something like that? No. Okay. Don't trust well, influencers for anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it sounds like you've done everything you could do um, except to reach out to Google. They, they, they do, you know, they have a contact address. You've emailed them and hope that they respond. Um, yeah, it's just, it's it's just that you know what it is though, Leo. It's just um, it's just a bot. So you just get a, a, a boilerplate template right. back, but no right. one actually reads your email. That may be that may be the case. Yeah, I have no idea what you do at this point. Um, oh. you, so you can't get into your Google account in any way, any form or fashion. It rejects you every time. It, it, and it's, it, you've done the thing where you say when you started the account and your last, uh, I have no I, idea. I have no I, idea. I, I, ha I, I have. And then what, what I did is I actually created, um, I have another email and I was wondering if, it, if it's okay with you, would I be able to, to give it to you or, or to give it out on air? And no, 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 no. That's a terrible oh, no. idea. Oh, it's just, oh, is that a terrible that's idea? just begging okay. for more problems. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, look, if you don't know, then nobody does. I, I have no idea. There are lots of people listening. If somebody has an idea, they can contact me. Uh, but I okay. think I think you might be uh, out of luck. Um, and I think this would be a very good plot point in your next script. It's not, you know, it's funny how many calls I get from people who say, uh, my Gmail, I can't get in anymore. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte, the... Tech Guy, time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, unlocking your Gmail account, can't help you. <laughs> 88, 88, ask Leo. Uh, if you're keeping score at home, I have failed on the last three questions. So well, let's try one more, see if I can do better. Mark on the line from my old stomping grounds, Lincoln, Rhode Island. Hello, Mark. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm wonderful. How uh, you little, doing? The Ocean State. Little Rody here. <laughs> I love Rody. My mom li lives in Cran Cranston. Wave your hands at, uh, at her yeah, over there. I'm, I'm northern Rhode Island, up in uh, in Lincoln area. I know where Lincoln is. We used to go to Lincoln Park all the time. I know Lincoln oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, big, I'm, I'm a big fan of you. I've been watching you since ZDTV days. Oh, thanks. The old screen day, screensaver days. Oh, yeah, the good old days. Yeah. No, and everybody who lives in Rhode Island says, are you any relation to Leo Laporte, the guy who was on WPRO <laughs> for 21 years? No, yeah. which is weird. But uh, I do have to say it's, I guess, a fairly common French-Canadian name because when I was a kid and I looked in the Providence phone book, there were seven Leo Laportes. So I'm one of the seven, but not that one. I, I want to wish uh, all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, I agree. Yeah. Especially, especially my mom, who's the... Most caring and loving person I know. Oh, what's her name? Kathleen. Kathleen, happy Mother's Day from Mark. Oh, I wish my mom in Cranston a happy Mother's Day this morning as well. Yeah, I sent her a picture. Oh, anyway. I have, a, I have a question. Have you played around with any smart note-taking apps like Rome Research? Oh, have I played with them all, my friend. And any others I should look at? That yeah, I'll give you a whole bunch of them. <laughs> I can go on and on. I don't know why, but I have a note-taking fetish. I never take notes, but I want the best way to do it. So there's a couple online. You mentioned Rome Research that are very interesting. They're trying to uh, take a modern approach to note-taking. You know, a few years ago, all the rage was 
getting things done, to-do lists, using the Dave Allen technique for managing your busy, busy day and all that. Everybody was in the productivity thing. And now it's the note-taking thing. And I'm not sure why, but it is a big topic of conversation. It, have, you, have you looked at Notion? Notion, yeah, I have looked at it. I haven't played around with it, but I have seen people mention So RomeResearch.com, these are both, you can try them for free. It, the idea of Rome Research is a little hard to get, but the idea is that they call it backlinks. The idea that when you type something, you can have it automatically create a page like a footnote that refers to that thing. And as over time, as you create your notes, pretty soon you have this rich interconnected database of ideas and thoughts that makes it easier for you to think about stuff and to try other stuff. Notion is similar. Notion.so. Uh, I think it's a little prettier. You know, Rome Research is a very kind of stark note-taking app. But those are both online and your data is stored online. In both cases, you can export it. But they're paid, they're services, ultimately paid services. There are other things you can do that are local. There's an open source app, Windows, Mac, and Linux called Joplin, J-O-P-L-I-N. Uh, I think because uh, named after Scott Joplin, the ragtime piano composer who had lots of notes. So Joplin okay. is a good one to try. And then there's one I've been kind of fallen in love with. It has all the benefits of, of uh, uh, Rome and, uh, and Notion and Joplin. Uh, it's not open source, but you can store your data locally. You do store your data locally, which is nice. And you store it in a format that is easy to read. It's called Markdown. You're familiar with Markdown if you've used any of these. It's called Obsidian. Obsidian. Okay. And it's my latest fave, obsidian.md. Yeah, I've been playing a, a lot with this Remnote, which is really interesting. It has the functions of the Rome Research, but it all has the ability to do flashcards in the app. Yeah, so this is one Pretty reason neat. one reason people use note-taking apps, and Remnote is specifically for this group, is because they want to do Anki-style flashcards. For instance, if you're a med student and you're writing down all the anatomy stuff you got to keep track of yeah. and you, you want flashcards, it's perfect for that. So, yeah, I played with Remnote. I'm not looking for a flashcard solution, so I was less interested. But if flashcards are what you want, um, absolutely, Remnote's one to look at. I like Obsidian because there are plugins. There's a very large community around it, and there are lots of plugins, including Flash and Flash Card plugins and others. It's very extensible. Okay. All of these systems. The only problem with them is they're deep and they're powerful, which means there's a lot to learn. And so it's the you know it's hard to sample them and not really get a sense of what they can do. But you don't want to start you know, all in on one of these things. If it doesn't suit and then move to another, that's what kind of what I've done, move to another, move to another. Uh, I was all in uh, on Rome. I actually paid the, what, 500 bucks to be the kind of sponsor of Rome, and I really yeah, like yeah. it. And then I was all in on Notion, and I used Notion like crazy. And then I found Joplin, and I found Obsidian. <laughs> There's also a million note-taking apps. Do you, do you use it when, when you do your writing or outlining for your show? Yeah, um, I don't write much, uh, but Obsidian, I find, is really good for outlining, for taking notes. You can do a daily journal in it. It's very good for that. Uh, I like it. It needs to be, for me, it needs to be cross-platform because I use you know everything, Windows, Mac. The only thing Obsidian is missing right now unlike Rome and uh, Notion, is uh, mobile apps. But those are in, in the works and soon. They're actually in beta now, so I think they're coming any day now. Because uh, I think you want it everywhere, right? You want to Because you want to be able yeah. to take notes everywhere. So, well, I'm, I'm a little old school, too. I, I'm starting to use a, a, a paper journal back in the day when yeah. I was in college. You know, <laughs> paper journal is not a bad idea. The problem is you have no backup. You know, you just have the one. you got to <laughs> store it. Uh, these the ideas of these is that you get the benefits of a paper journal with the benefits of digital together, uh, and I think that you know if I if I were a student I would have probably settled on one of them and used them. I think Obsidian is going to be the one that I will continue to use, and I would definitely take a look at that. You can get me; I can go on for hours about note taking. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much for yeah. your... It's a very rich subject. It's a very rich subject. And you, and the idea, the theory is, it goes back to a, 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 a German guy at the turn of the last century who was doing this on paper. He's doing little slips of paper called a Zettelkasten. 
which is German for slip box, a Zettel Kasten. And um, a guy named Nicholas Luhmann, who actually lived in the, uh, he passed away in 98, had a Zettel Kasten of 90,000 index cards. And he claims it's what allowed him to write over 70 books and 400 scholarly articles. He was quite, became quite famous for this method. Now, the problem was it was on paper notes. And uh, so a lot of people who are doing this note-taking stuff are essentially trying to create a new Zettel Kasten for a digital age that lets you write down any random thought that comes to your head or a longer form thing, a journal, classroom notes, put it all into one single system. And, and this is the key, have it all interlinked. Easy, and the idea is easily, without a lot of work, have it all interlinked so that you can come up with new ideas based on the collection of old ideas, I guess. I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm not that organized. You know, I'm one of those, I'm one of those people who says every, uh, every year or so, I'm going to write a journal and write about three days and I stop. But uh, one of these days, the nice thing, the reason I like Obsidian, it's not open source, which I wish it was, but it is saving all of your data in an open format that can easily be read by anything else. It's called Markdown and you store it locally. Uh, they have a synchronization system you can use, but you don't have to. You store it locally. You can put it on Dropbox or OneDrive or uh, iCloud or somewhere and have it sync. And by doing that, you know, you kind of don't lose control of your data, which is really important. As, as you could tell from Sam, our screenwriter, who I'm sorry to say seems to have lost control of his script, uh, of his Gmail account. That's You can see why backup, why I talk about backup all the time. It's just a heartbreaker. Chris Marquardt. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? We, we have to work on your pronunciation of Zettelkasten. Zettel, how do you say it? No, no. The, uh, any German word that starts with a Z or Z yeah. is uh, pronounced like a T-S. So it's Zettelkasten. 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 All right. Zettelkasten. Not there you go. Zettel. That's, it's Zettelkasten. Easy. Got it. Yeah, I know. English words are with a Z in the beginning are soft, but the German Z in Z the beginning is Z hard. Zettelkasten. Zettelkasten. Got it. Zettelkasten. 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 Oh, you really hit the T. Zettelkasten. Got it. Zettelkasten. Zettelkasten. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you use that Zettelkasten? No. <laughs> of course not. Well, in a digital form, yes, but mine is mostly ASCII, so. Yeah. Well, that's what's nice about this um, obsidian. It's ASCII. It's it's a markdown. So yeah. you you know you don't ever risk. Yeah, it. I don't even need the markdown. I yeah. I take ASCII notes. Yeah, that's fine for me. It's, so it's and 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 they and they gotta be searchable. It's to site case. No, I'm a fan of I'm a fan of um, notational velocity or oh, I its, love that. its successor. Its successor uh, NV Ultra, which is right yes. now beta. Awesome. So that's it. I should have mentioned that. That's all. It's Mac. Is it Mac only though? Is the only problem? Uh, I think it I is. Think so. Yeah. But I should have mentioned that because I really like what Brett's doing with this. They're, you know, he brought back. And then I I use the I use their I use the format uh, text files in a directory and those sync across right. multiple perfect computer you need. systems. Yeah. And then on on the on iOS I use Byword. Which Love looks Byword. into the yeah. same directory in Love the same directory. And that's Markdown. See, both of those support Markdown. You could use Markdown. That's true. That's true. No. I do use Markdown in many places, just not in my notes because I'm too lazy. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be simple, quick. I agree. I, I don't, I'd I don't rather have like ten thousand text files. You know, I keep it all up here, yeah. all upstairs, where I could forget it promptly. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, f I forget too many things, so I kind of need to write things down. Yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo is the phone number. This would be a good time if you've been having a hard time getting through. I think a lot of people go into brunch with mom. Uh, Jimmy on the line in Whittier, California, our next caller. Hi, Jimmy. Hi. Hey, thanks for hanging on. What can I do for you? You bet. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm going to have a baby. And Congratulations. I, is, thank this, you. is this your first? Your first? No, this is, 
this is going to be my fifth. Oh, so it's less of an occasion. <laughs> well, well, I mean, there's a lot of people involved, so it's kind of a bigger occasion. It's always an occasion. That's right. Oh, how that's wonderful. Congratulations. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So what's going to happen is I'm bringing, well, I'm trying to get my mother-in-law down to help us uh, because there's four other uh, young ones under 10 years old that uh, kind of need some supervision while we're at the hospital and just trying to recover and, and everything over the next couple of days. Well, assuming it, it's going to happen here any day now. Oh, my gosh. Um, All right. Well, I'm sorry to keep you on hold so long, Jimmy. Let's let's hurry up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. So we were testing out remote PZ types of stuff because she works in an accounting office. And uh, we, we just needed something for like a couple of weeks. I know you always talk about your sponsors, but I don't need something for a year. We just need a quick, yeah, yeah. dirty sort of thing. So we there are some companies that offer free versions. Yeah. Uh, uh, TeamViewer is a good example. Yeah, uh, we tried that. And we were, we were going between her computer up in Paso Robles and our computer down here, and we couldn't get it to work. Uh, I'm not sure what we did wrong. I don't know if it's a router setting or something like that. Is she going to use it in the hospital, or is she going to use it at your house? No, at our, at our house. Okay. So our backup plan, we just tried quick and dirty Zoom with screen sharing. Remote you know what? Control. That's not a bad way to that do works. it. Yeah. Did it work? But that required it. It did, but it required someone on the other end to, you know, Except. connect the computer yeah. and hit control access and all that jazz. So I'm just wondering if there's something else that will just work that you could recommend. There are a million of these. Uh, the problem okay. is uh, if there are some issues um, with routing, some of they may all have the same kind of problem. But it's worth trying some other ones. The folks who do uh, log me in, have you probably heard of that? Okay have a free solution called join.me. Log, log me in, I think, still has a free tier, but uh, join.me is the kind of easy web base. What's interesting that, that has changed is used to be you'd have to install software, and a lot of these systems like join.me do it in the browser using WebRTC. So that may make it easier to use. Okay. So I would certainly take a look at that. Um, cool. Jitsi has is a is is kind of like Zoom, but it's an open source Zoom uh, that is also has screen sharing. J I T. Well, but you need somebody on the other end, I think. Yeah. 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 Ch yeah. Huh. Um, I'm I'm gonna ask the chat room because they've tried a lot of these. You know, I uh, I just use Remote PC obviously because they're the sponsor. I but get it. I get but uh, it. I think they have tried quite a few of them. Um, I see the problem, though, because almost everything has screen sharing, like Zoom, but you need, it's right. a call, so you need somebody on the other end. You can't just, uh, and you want it so that she can put it on her computer at her house and come and come and visit, take care of the baby, and log in exactly. from your house. Yeah. She, she just wants to be able to click something, see her screen, go on to QuickBooks, do the, you know, maybe an hour of accounting work in the system for her company and, you know, know that it's taken care of, answer a quick call if someone in her business, you know, needs information because it's not. A I have business, to say, I have to say the free constraint is probably the big constraint. Almost everybody has okay. a free tier that isn't very good. Our sponsor remote PC, if it's just two computers, it's $4 for a whole year. Oh, okay. I, well, if you can if you can kick off kick up the four bucks, I think remote PC is fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> I would I would you know, four bucks. Come on, that's less than a Starbucks. You could probably do that, right? Exactly. Sign me up right now. <laughs> that's for a year. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm a little I'm a little uh, loyal to our sponsors, as you might imagine. They keep the show on the air, but. I do think they have a great product, and I think at that price, you might as well just try it. They do have a seven-day trial that you can try it without giving them a credit card, so there's no, you know, none of that automatic renewal thing. You can at yeah. least see if it will work. Cool. And, I, I'm happy to try that. I just assumed it was all subscription-based, and I was going to get locked in and something and have to deal with it. But well, you're, 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 bucks, it's four bucks, so yeah, <laughs> you're locked. You're locked in for four bucks. <laughs> But after that, you can quit. Hey, that's great. Congratulations. I'm so excited. Any day now, huh? Oh, yeah. Her due date is May 15th. And oh. frankly, she's, 
she's threatening. She's ready. You know, it could go right now. Oh, <laughs> she's ready. You you better believe it. And it's so nice your 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 mother in law is coming down to to help out. That's yes. wonderful. That yes. makes a big, especially with four others. That makes a big difference. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, Jimmy. Thank you so much. Sounds Appreciate like, it. Leo. Sounds like a pretty special Mother's Day at your place. Wow, that's really cool. You know, I try to. Uh, <laughs> I love our sponsors. I'm so grateful to them. They they keep the show on the air, and I. But I also try to be an objective journalist. You can't buy me just because you sponsor it. I mean, I have a little soft spot. I confess there are plenty of other uh, solutions out there. Um, but uh, since remote PC has worked so well in most cases, I've involved been involved, and in, I would try it. There's also, you know, if you have Chrome OS, there's. Uh, Chrome has a remote desktop solution. There's really so many of these. And I think it's because there was for many years and still is an open source free remote desktop called VNC. And that's the other one you might want to look at. There are a lot of VNC clients and servers and so forth. It's a little more geeky, a little more tricky. Most VNC uh, solutions are free or at least have a free version. And I suspect that a lot of um, the remote access stuff was based on that. Nowadays, thanks to Google's WebRTC, which allows a browser to do this, I think uh, I think it's going to get easier and easier and more and more common, to be honest. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll be back with more of the Tech Guy podcast in just a little bit, but first a word from Udacity. I've been a member since 2012 when Sebastian Thrun first started Udacity. Udacity is the world's fastest, most efficient way to get the skills you need to get the great job you want. Take your tech skills to the next level. Master the skills that employers are actually looking for. How do they know? Because the biggest companies in the world partner with Udacity to uh, create these nano degrees. Udacity offers a unique part-time, you can do it in your spare time, online educational program designed to bridge the gap between school and your career goals. As part of their nano degree programs, you could put in just five to ten hours a week. You could do it as fast as three months, and you'll get a suite of employable skills because Udacity partners with industry leaders. They know IBM, Microsoft, Google, AWS. These companies work with Udacity to create these nano degree programs because they need people with these skills. So meet them halfway. Udacity is fantastic. When you enroll in a specific course offering, you'll be able to view the online course. There's videos, of course, with some of the best instructors in the world. Really great content. But they don't stop there, and I really admire them for that. It's so important that you get hands-on experience. So Udacity will have you complete a series of projects, plus there are support courses designed to help you develop job-relevant skills. And because they know that, you know, in many cases you have another job, you're gonna, you want to get a better job, so you can do this part-time, any time of the day or night, and your schedule. Udacity will help you build a portfolio on GitHub or LinkedIn to show prospective employers. They have classes to teach you how to network, to get noticed, to land the job you want. And they have nano-degree programs in some of the most sought-after technology uh, areas. This is for both consumers and for businesses. Things the top 10 include data engineering. I bet you that some of these will really be of great interest to you. Data analyst, product manager, C++ programming. It's not all hard skills, too. It's digital marketing. You can build skills through. And these are all skills, as I said, that are in demand from the companies. They want people with these skills. You can build these skills through these industry-leading programs designed and recognized by top companies worldwide. No wonder over 14 million people in over 240 countries, that's pretty much all of them, use Udacity. Incredible programs that'll fit the niche that you want to learn more about. AI, cloud computing. You want to program self-driving cars? You, yep, autonomous systems, data science, programming, and more. You can also improve your earning potential, get real employable skills through project-based active learning that covers cutting-edge technology. You won't just have to do a project. It'll be a project you'll be reviewed by qualified professionals. You'll get real human help, personalized code reviews. There are even mentors there 24-7. So you're not on your own, but you're just going to get to do the work, and that's the main thing. When you get that hands-on experience, you really learn. 
Of course, they have flexible payment options. You can learn at your own pace and schedule. There are even free courses. In fact, that might be a great way to start. I'll give you an example. I just thought this was so good. I want to, I want to tell again. Francisco Gutierrez, he, he really is a smart guy. He loved technology, but he couldn't afford a four-year degree, four degree, you know, a CS degree or an EE degree. So he participated in uh, something Udacity had, and they have similar challenges like this all the time, called the Grow with Google Udacity Challenge. He won a full scholarship for the Mobile Web Specialist Nano degree. And the thing is, then he put in the work. He did the work. He went through the program. He did great. He got an internship on Microsoft and he now is, they offered him a full-time role as a software engineer. He's now working there, super happy, and it all happened through Udacity. And that's just one of millions of stories. Technology is disrupting enterprises across every industry. With Udacity for Enterprise, you can upskill your workforce. So don't forget they have classes and programs for businesses as well as individuals. Check out the website for more information. Get the in-demand tech skills you need to advance your career or the skills your team needs to keep everything flowing smoothly, visit udacity.com slash twit and get 30 days free access. Hey, that's great. You get access to the whole thing for free. That's worth $399. Don't miss out. But you have to do this before May 31st, 2021. So if you've heard me talking about Udacity, and I have been for years, and you've wondered, this is a great way to do it for free for 30 days. You could probably finish a course in 30 days if you worked really hard, but at least you get a sense. You can try a lot of what I would do is instead of trying one course for 30 days, I would try a lot of different courses, see which ones you like the best or the fields you're interested in. Udacity, U-D-A-C-I-T-Y, udacity.com slash twit. Thank you, Udacity, for supporting the tech guy. Udacity.com slash twit. Now back to the show. It's time for Chris Marquardt, photo guy. He is my personal photo sensei and can be yours too at sensei, S-E-N-S-E-I dot photo. Hello, Chris. Moin, moin. Hey, how are you? I am great. How moin, moin. You? Moin, moin. <laughs> I actually was watching a German TV show called, oh, a wonderful show called Babylon Berlin. And they said moin, moin. And I went, Wow. I know what that means. There you go. <laughs> the rest of it, I was looking at the subtitles. So Chris is a wonderful digital photographer, film photographer, too. You can find his stuff on Flickr and elsewhere. Listen to his great podcast, Tips from the Top Floor, at tfttf.com. Um, and he joins us every week to talk about a different aspect of photography. What, do you, what, what, do you, what, what is on the agenda today, Chris? Well, it's uh, I think it's now two weeks ago that we had the Worldwide Pinhole Day, which is a once in a year recurrence. Wait, wait, um, what? Worldwide Pinhole Day? Pinhole Day, and and it's about pinhole photography. Pinhole oh. cameras take you into a different visual world. It's different from our normal cameras, but it's it's pretty much the original camera, the one that everything comes for is a pinhole camera, and the principle behind it is. It's pure simplicity. You don't need a lens. All you need is a is a box that is light tight, and then you need a tiny little hole on one side, and on the inside, on the opposite side of that hole, an image will form. And that's pretty oh, much it. So okay. that's how photography began. You don't need a lens; and just a hole. You need a hole. That is all you need. And uh, and there are a couple of parameters. The first is the size of the hole, of course, like more. A bigger, bigger hole means um, there's more light coming in, so the exposure doesn't have to be that long. Um, but the bigger the hole, the less sharp the, the image is. So you you want kind of a very small hole. That's why it's, why it's a pin hole. So a small pin will do the trick. And uh, the second parameter with pinhole cameras is the distance of the pinhole from the sensor or the film in the camera. Because the further away it is the 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 more telephoto the lens gets and the closer it is the more wide angle the lens gets and that is all you need to know and um uh, so I, this the, is the a case of, of where, those, where a picture is worth a thousand words because you show some of the pictures i sent you you gotta yes, see absolutely. you gotta see this is a picture because, of flowers so what a pinhole camera does is, and that's, that's kind of the interesting thing, is it, it gives you a slightly blurry image. Again, the blur depends on the size of the hole. Right. But um, it gives you a picture that is sharp from, or the same kind of sharpness from the very closest 
piece of the camera to the furthest thing in the distance. Oh, so weird, you know, you, rem yeah. you know how our regular cameras have what's called depth of field. So you have one area in the picture that's sharp and everything behind it in the front is not so sharp. And we, we simulate this with a, with a um, um, portrait mode. That's what cameras usually do. A pinhole camera doesn't do that. It has everything in focus from very close to very far. Oh, wait a minute. And I understand because depth of field is affected by the size of the aperture of the camera. The bigger the aperture, the uh, the the shallower the depth of field. And so, yes. and then when you get it down to a small aperture, an f11 or 22, the depth of field gets bigger. So, pinhole is the smallest possible aperture. A pinhole is pretty much just the aperture without the lens. And we're talking really tiny apertures here. And if you go through some of the photos, you'll, you'll see that all of them show that the very close things and very far things are both in focus um, or as in focus as they can be with a pinhole camera. Cam yeah. Pinhole cameras give you a bit of a dreamy kind of look, a bit of a oh, that's slightly cool. out of focus look. Now, and are now these this exposed on the you're looking at? Are they exposed on the film? I guess they are, right? You can do this with film. You can do this with digital cameras. Oh. It's easy. Um, you can you can buy a pinhole with for your camera with the with the bayonet of your camera with the mount of your camera. They are they are available at B and H and other places, and they're um, cheap because there's no glass in them. <laughs> well, they will they'll still set you back like thirty bucks. So yeah. they're they're still, but it's but this is a pinhole camera is something that is is soup or a pinhole for your camera is very simple to make. All you need is. Uh, what's called a body cap, which oops, here I have one here, which is the thing that goes on your on your mirrorless camera or your uh, DSLR. When you take the lens off, you can put a body cap on it to close that hole. Um, just get one of those; they are really cheap. Drill a hole in the middle, like a bigger hole with a drill, and then uh, stick a piece of aluminum foil on it and pin a hole into that, and you have your own pin pinhole cap. It's Again, it doesn't cost you anything. It's not complicated, pretty much. is it? Yeah. No, it's not complicated. Um, you you can do interesting things with pinholes. For example, I've once been in a pinhole room, which is just that you can do this at home. Uh, find a room that has a small window and then take some black foil and make that room light tight and then put a, a, put a hole in that, uh, in that uh, foil and wait a bit until your eyes have kind of adapted to the dark. Because it's and then pretty dim. All yeah. of a sudden, yeah. on the opposite side, you will see what is outside in front of your window. These look um, kind of the wide angle camera, too. Are they, is it, is it, is it somehow wide angle? It is, well, it, you just, you determine that where, where your zoom lens would have a, a wide angle and a, and a telephoto setting. A pinhole camera determines that by the, distance between the hole and the sensor ah. so um and that distance is what we call the focal length you've okay. heard that before yes yeah, so, so that's what if that you is. move that oh. pinhole if you move that close to the sensor or the film you get more wide angle because you reduce the focal length and uh yeah that that's why some of those pinhole cameras are super wide angle because it's easy to do you just move the pinhole Oh, how and they have long exposures. That's that's the other thing. They have long exposures. The one that you're showing right now is a so-called solar graph, which is a, a, a pretty much a soda can or a beer can with a piece of photo paper in the back. It's like curved in the back, and on the opposite side there's a pinhole. And then you tie that to a to a tree or something and leave it out for half a year, and then pick it half up again. Half a year. The, that's a six month you long see the picture. Sun. Oh, what you see goodness. there are the streaks of the sun over a month or more. And, oh, that's uh, why. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's why it's going. That's it's in different planes. <laughs> Holy cow. And the reason it does this weird curve is because the photo paper is curved inside the camera. So you get this strange uh, shape wow. there. Wow. So the biggest camera ever has been a pinhole camera. It's actually uh, was back in 2002. Six, I think, in Irvine, California. And it was an F-18 hangar. <laughs> and they made this into a 100 foot, 100 feet wide and 30 feet high pinhole camera. They made it light tight. They put a pinhole there with, I think, about an inch as, of, of the pinhole size. And then they exposed a photo of what was opposite of the hangar directly onto a large stretched out canvas. Wow. Amazing. 
So wow. pinhole. It's, Can you it's do fun. this with end. your smartphone? Uh, that is kind of the biggest problem. There are a couple of apps out there. If you look for pinhole camera apps that will simulate what a pinhole does, but real actual pinhole photography is best done with a mirrorless camera or interchangeable lens camera, pretty much. Wow. DSLR, wow. for example. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes to the world's largest photo taken with the world's largest <laughs> yes. pinhole camera. It's not the most impressive photo I've ever seen. No, they, they, they couldn't move the camera, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's interesting. Uh, yep. It's there. There's something there. Wow. Chris Marquardt, always inspiring. We have a little photo assignment, zigzag. We want you to illustrate the word or concept, zigzag. Find a great image. you got to take a new one. That's the whole point of this. Upload it to our Flickr group, the Tech Guy group on Flickr.com. Tag it, TG Zigzag. Got a couple more weeks, three more weeks. Chris will review the uh, the best of the best in about, uh, about three weeks. Thank you, Chris Marquardt. Thank you. It was 24 billion by 14 billion pixels. No, zero pixels. No pixels. All, uh, all, whatever that photo frame thing was. Wow, that is wild. Yeah, they didn't have much choice in the in, in the composition of the no, image, though. It's whatever's out there. <laughs> that's really. I mean, you could probably have taken a mirror in front of the pinhole or something. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, yeah. It's at the Smithsonian now, which is kind of neat. Uh, yeah. My friend, thank you. Uh, please let me know when you start the travels up again next year. I would really like to go on one of these. So, I was thinking yeah, Bhutan. Are I'm, you going to do Bhutan again? You think? I want to do Bhutan. I'm currently in talks with our uh, organizer up out there. Um, he doesn't didn't have any business for over a year. Yeah, so poor guy. He's uh, and he's in India, and India is in bad shape right now. Oh, so man, yeah. Um, I hope for him to start up uh, again pretty soon. Okay. I talked to Lisa. She said, I'm not doing Svalbard. I told her about the frozen boat. She said, nope. Oh, because of the cold? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bhutan, Bhutan, is, Bhutan is amazing. It's I said cultural, Bhutan would be really cool. Uh, She's into Buddhism. Yeah. I think it would be very, very cool to see Bhutan. Oh, I, she would I, totally love yeah, it. Yeah. She would I'd totally like to do love it. it. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to do it. So put me down for Bhutan. Put, put us down for Bhutan when you go. I will certainly do that. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks, Chris. So we'll, we'll see if, it, if we can do it next year, but I'll yeah, keep you updated. It might be a couple of years. Sure. I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I hope, <laughs> except Bhutan. Yeah, we all hope. That. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> all right. See you next Take week. Bye bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Richard is on the line from uh, Westchester, New York. Hello, Richard. How are you, sir? I am well. How are you? So much better. A uh, week ago, my Apple Watch reported AFib. Oh my! In Kona, Hawaii. Wow! You were on vacation. I was on vacation. And what did the watch and do? Did it buzz? Did it buzz? Did it say, "Hey, hey, hey, get a doctor"? What did it do? I was taking a nap, and the alarm. Of course, I honestly, I don't remember. One question you have, I don't remember. It woke me up from a nap. And I literally had to drive myself 30 miles to a hospital. Holy cow. The doctor, the doctor in the hospital said that it's possible the Apple Watch saved my life. It sounds like it did. Had you ignored it, who knows what would have happened? Wow, that you know, we hear these stories from time to time, but this is the first time I've ever talked to anybody that actually saved your life. That is pretty cool. Pretty cool. I have become I have become an Apple fan, and one of the uh, byproducts of this is my wife can no longer say anything when I want to upgrade my watch <laughs> for the rest of my life. Honey, it's a life saving tool. <laughs> So how are you feeling now? Are you okay? Um, I'm I'm well on the road to recovery. Good. I've never had a food before, and I'm I'm quite healthy. Um, I have been a fan of yours for decades since um, 
uh, uh, screensaver days. Thank you, Richard. You know, I wear one. I uh, love my Apple Watch. Uh, you know, when it first came out, I was skeptical, worried a little bit. But now, thanks to the variety of things it does, and you just added one more, I am i don't take it off. I got my 88-year-old mom an Apple Watch, too, because I wanted a, the fall protection and the uh, emergency call feature. But that's another great feature. Had you Do you have to turn something on on the watch to have it be monitoring for that, or it just does that automatically? It's as far as I know, it's a default. And if I give nice. can give you another maybe fifteen seconds, this thing goes off. I wake up from a nap, and of course, the first thing you do is go down the river of denial. Right. Oh, it's just a watch. How could it know? None of this is happening. I feel fine. That's one of the problems with AFib is you might feel fine. Anyway, I cleaned off the sensors, and I used the pulse, uh, the ability to take a pulse quickly. Yes. Which I had on my watch face. Yes. And one pulse came in a little over 50. Another pulse came in over 150. Whoa. And I said, I've got, I've got to go now. <laughs> Let's go to the doctor. Wow. Good for you. Now, I'm sure your doctor told you about this, but there's another device that you can get for under 100 bucks. That uh, I, uh, friends of mine who've had AFib swear by. It's called the Cardia. Are you familiar with the Cardia? You might have seen I'm it. Right. I'm right. I'm <laughs> Yeah. AliveCore.com. It is a very interesting two thumb EKG. It's not as good as the multi lead EKG they'll, EKG they'll give you in the hospital, obviously. But it is a really great thing for people who've had uh, AFib. Uh, it'll send it. It'll detect uh, atrial fibrillation, bradycardia, tachycardia, uh, and you can send it off to a doctor or your doctor. Um, so, I, as a public service announcement uh, on your behalf, AliveCore, A L I V E C O R dot com, and it's inexpensive. It works with your smartphone, uh, and I think it's a really, really good idea. So, I am so Richard. I'm so glad to hear that you're all right, and I'm thrilled to hear that the watch saved your life. That's fantastic. Well done. This was the right place to share it. Um, I have, of course, become an evangelist. I bet. And to be honest with you, I can't even get my own family to wear Apple watches. Ugh. So we're all caught up in it. <laughs> Listen, it saved Richard's life. It could save yours. That's really great, Richard. Thank you for the call. It's a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad you're safe and sound. We're going to be going out to uh, the Big Island ourselves in a couple of months. Was it a nice visit other than that? It, I can't say enough about living in a postcard. Yeah. Um, and the people. The people of Hawaii I love are the people. extraordinary. Yeah. And I kept joking that it must be something in the water. <laughs> well, there's a lot of it, <laughs> especially on the wet side. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure talking to you, Richard. I'm glad you're okay. That is such a great story. What a great... By the way, my Apple Watch is telling me I should stand up right now. I guess I should listen to it. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. My watch tells me to stand up. It tells me to sit down. It tells me to breathe. And I know it's doing it out of love. Well, I don't think the watch loves me, but it's but, it's, but it cares about me. Uh, on we go with the show. That was a nice story, huh? Glad to, glad Richard's still here. Hey, Andrew, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Andrew calling for Ventura. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And happy Mother's Day, to everybody. Happy Mother's Day. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of tweaked out at Apple. Oh no! So, some twelve year old kid started putting gray text on a white background it is so hard to read i know i hate that too i don't need adaptive <laughs> services i don't need high contrast anything but everybody's copying apple and so many things are so hard to read leo you have so much influence on the world please tell everybody <sighs> to, to bitch at all the providers use better contrast text uh, it, you, i have been for years uh i just don't understand now they do it kind of uh, a lot of times in the fine print, <laughs> which tells you something about the fine print, I guess. Uh, but more and more, we're seeing websites that don't do, you know, they don't use the maximum contrast for design reasons. You know who I blame for this? 
And it started at the turn of the century as Wired Magazine. Uh, Louis Rosetta, the publisher. Colors. Yeah, they wanted it to be hip. So they would combine the most unreadable colors. You know, you get purple text on a black background. You couldn't read it. And it was hip and with it. And I think that that influenced a generation of designers who even to this day, to this day, uh, well, they're, you're, you nailed it. They're 20. <laughs> they're young kids. They have good uh, eyesight. And they can, they can read it. They say, what you, what's your problem, old timer? You can't read it? What's your problem? <laughs> Apple. I use ubiquity equipment, and on the ubiquity webpage, there's a lot of stuff that's grayed out or, yeah. or grayed out because it's uh, not active or whatever the case. So I sent a, a screenshot and I said, "Hey, you guys, please make better colors. This is hard to read." And the the uh, tech no support person responded back, "Well, it says this and it says that." Oh yeah, here's what it says, buddy. Okay, so I'm going to give you some tips. You can obviously, in many cases, cut and paste into a text editor, which will show black text on white background and make it readable. But almost all browsers, and this is actually a kind of a black diamond tip. This is a more advanced tip, but will solve this problem. Most all browsers will allow you to create a custom style sheet that you can use that will override the settings that the web designer put on a page. And the reason for that is specifically for people with low vision, uh, poor vision, or people who just, the fonts are too small or the contrast is too low, you can fix it. Now, it's a complicated thing to do, but there are places to do it. The Chrome even has a thing called StyleBot, which is an extension that will let you say what you want the styles to be. You can pick them. I would look at the Chrome extension StyleBot if you're using Chrome. But all browsers do this. It's just a, most people don't do it because it's a lot of work. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, it drives me nuts uh, too, Andrew. I, every time, every, every time. One of my clients is a quadriplegic. He's in bed, and he can he moves the mouth mouse by voice. Right. So it, in order to find a control, it takes this poor guy forever to move the mouse all over the screen to try to find where a thing to click is. <sighs> what I, happened to highlighting? I with, know. Designers, um, this is an issue. Um, for some reason, they just, uh, you know, they, they're big on design. I would look at this. Which browser do you use? Um, I use Safari on the iPad stuff and okay. uh, Chrome on uh, my PC and Mac. So I'm not sure about Safari on the iPad. You I'll know, look for CSS, though. I, I, yeah, I, style, go to stylebot.dev. It's okay. a browser extension which will let you say, no, no, no. I, this is, I want black text on a white background or whatever you like best. And it will override this. The, it, it, if they're using CSS, which almost every site does, it will override the uh, CSS. It's open source. It's free. It's uh, safe to use. And it lets you basically decide no more. No, no, no more of this eight-point gray font <laughs> on a black background or a white background. I'm with you 100%. No, it drives me nuts. have to get the word out to people. Yeah. The other thing I do... Be kind to the visually impaired. Yeah. Well, absolutely. The other thing, uh, and, and even just us old people over 40, uh, another thing I also always do is I ex and expand, make the text bigger. Usually control plus on any browser will make the text bigger, and that often helps, oh, yeah. too. I, I can read it. It's just, it just takes it's, so much work. It's, it's a strain on the brain. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the call, Richard. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Enjoy your day. Take, take care. You too. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. That's me. Time to talk about computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that stuff, the technology that surrounds us, engulfs us, devours us. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number, 888-827-5536. Or as in our last caller, Richard's case, saves our lives. That was a great story, Richard. Uh, had atrial fibrillation, which is a very dangerous condition while he was in Hawaii. The watch woke him up. 
He said, what? Went to the doctor. The doctor said, that, the Apple Watch saved your life. That's pretty cool. It, but you don't have to call with that kind of story. Any story will do. 8888. Uh, ask Leo. Let's say hello next to Ka uh, Cavett in Costa Mesa, California. Hi, Cavett. Hi. Hey. <laughs> I can't believe I got on. You this got on. You got. You know why I figured the phones are a little slow today. I think everybody's taking mom to, at least I hope, everybody's taking mom to brunch. What can yeah, I do for I'm you? I'm on my way to pick up my mom now. See? So I, Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So I have a question for you since I'm on. Um, Drop, um, Dropbox, years and years ago, you had a plug for Dropbox. And and so for the last two or three years, maybe longer, I have used Dropbox. Yeah, I think it's a good service. Yeah. But now I want to change. Yes. So, And I've got probably two or three terabytes that are still <gasps> on Dropbox. <gasps> And, and I want to know how to easily transfer it over to another service. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes. I don't know if there's a way to easily do this. Do you know what the service is that you're going to move to? Well, I was thinking iDrive. So you want to go to, because you're, you know, I think iDrive, which is uh, uh, a backup solution, is not exactly the same as Dropbox, which is a file syncing solution. Ah. So, um that might not give you all the features you want. I think of iDrive really as a backup. Maybe um, I'm confused then, because I use Dropbox as a backup. Well, that's fine. In fact, then you should use iDrive instead, because Dropbox is not a great backup solution. <laughs> you can use it that way. The problem with Dropbox is it will synchronize deletions. So if you're backing up some data and you delete it from the original thinking I've got a backup, it will also delete the backup, uh, which can be a problem. iDrive will not do that. That's so, why I want to switch. <laughs> yes. So uh, you can, I mean, the easiest thing would be if you have a copy of everything on, on Dropbox on your computer, you don't have to do anything. You just put iDrive on the computer and say, make sure you get that folder. Except over the last three to five years, we've gone through three or five computers and so the very first computer was backed up on that. Ah, so you have some stuff on, on the cloud that you don't have on your local computer. Yeah. Got yes. it. Yeah. Um, so iDrive actually specifically is reaches out to people who want to move from Dropbox because they realize there's quite a few people like you who thought they were right. getting a great backup solution. Uh, and uh, really, I, Dropbox is more about cloud syncing they might have a way to move i'm not sure that you know what they say is well just take your dropbox folder on your local computer and uh make sure that iDrive backs that up but it sounds like you need to actually download it in fact i would say download it sooner than later because if the only copy of anything is in one place it doesn't matter if it's in the cloud or on your hard drive it's at risk so that's always a risky thing is to have only one copy. So I would download that stuff from uh, Dropbox. Now, it's a ton of storage. One way to do this, it's going to take a while. It's not going to be over, you know, uh, overnight. It might be over a day or two. I would go out and get an external hard drive. Seagate makes inexpensive four terabyte external hard drives. Designate that as your Dropbox sync and just let it run until it's complete. Now, everything that's in Dropbox is now on that Seagate. Uh, and that's a good thing. You want to have a local copy as well. And then you can have iDrive back that up. No, it won't have any trouble backing that up. It works well with it. But as far as you know, there isn't anything that can go, like, uh, like go cloud to cloud. There are in some circumstances, absolutely. But I don't know of a way to do that. The other thing, if it's really big, you can ask iDrive to send you a hard drive. And, oh. and they will. And uh, so that would be the other faster way to do it. Because remember... You've got to download it from Dropbox. That's going to take a while. Then you have to upload it to iDrive, which is going to take even longer because your upload speed isn't as fast as your download speed. So for those situations, iDrive will actually send you a hard drive. Uh, you put it on there, and, and they put it in their cloud. And that's a lot faster, a lot faster. Okay. So uh, okay. somebody's telling me that a Seagate backup plus 8 terabyte drives at Costco are 120 bucks. Wow, hundreds! It's a, I know, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. 
Uh, and I like, I have to say, I like having a local copy in addition to cloud. Again, remember, you want two copies of at least of everything. Three would be better. Right. So, yeah, that's that's actually great that you have it all on, on Dropbox. It's wonderful. Uh, yeah, we just got used to, you know, loading it all there and saving it all there. So That's great. And it is a backup as long as you're, you know, you make sure that you don't synchronize deletions. We we shut off the sync. Fun yeah, function. yeah. After you get it up there, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna, uh, you know, I, th you know, somehow you want to get it down to a local copy in any way. Yeah. And then okay. you can either do it slowly, uh, trickle it up to iDrive. This is something that people have to remember with any cloud backup. It's only as fast as your upstream, which is usually a lot slower than your downstream. And in fact, it won't even use all of your upstream. It'll only use a fraction of it just to make sure it doesn't block your internet. So right. it's going to tr trickle is the word, trickle it up to the iDrive cloud. Once it's once it's done doing that, it'll be very fast. But the initial seeding, as they call it, is is a little slower. That's why sometimes people just say, send me a hard drive and I'll back it up. I think the first thing for you to do is get it off Dropbox. And I wouldn't delete the Dropbox account right away. I'd wait and make sure you got everything before you okay. do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank I think you, you know it's just probably the right thing to do. I would, in fact, the other thing to look at is maybe a network attached storage with an iDrive backup. My my uh, Synology is the company I recommend. My Synology NAS keeps copies of everything. I have it's like thirty or something terabytes. Keeps copy of everything, and then I have iDrive running on that, and it will back up from that. So I, now it's kind of the best of both worlds. That's, and what was that called, Leo? It, they call those network attached storage or NAS NAS devices, okay. and the one I use is Synology. It's the one I recommend. Uh, that's a pricier solution, but much more flexible. Gives okay. you lots of options. All hey, right. nice to talk to you, Cabot. Thank you very much. Have Appreciate a great it. day. All right. Take care, Space Guy Rod Pile. Getting getting connected. He's our space guy. He's coming up at the bottom of the hour. 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Just checking to see. I'm looking at the chat room to see if anybody in the chat room has a solution for... Um, it would be really nice, once something's in the cloud, if you could just push a button and say, move clouds. But, you know, they don't want you to do that. They don't. Dropbox doesn't want to make it easy to leave, right? So, I'm not sure. If somebody comes up with something, I'll let you know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888 Ask Leo. We're digging deep, deep tracks on our Mother's Day show. Thank you to Professor Laura, our musical director, for finding that. From a band out of New Jersey called Fountains of Wayne. That's right, Kim. That's right. Jimmy in Panama City, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Jimmy. Hey, how are you? I am well. How are you? Great. I just sorry I had you on speakerphone. I wanted to get on the phone so I could hear your voice clear. Thank you. Hello. How are you? What can I do for you? <laughs> so you know, there was. I am a long time listener. Love your show. Thank you. Um, and listening over in uh, Panama City on WFLA. Nice. Years ago, I used to love Picasso, and then it you know then it went to the wayside. It's a sad story. Sad, sad yeah. story. So you know, I found a product called Monument, which is a, like a Kickstarter type solution. But what what do people do nowadays besides you know continue to pay monthly fees that grow you know every know. year because you're you're running out of space? What do we do? Picasso, with Picasso? which was a really good photo collection cataloging and editing program that was just it was it was the sweet spot. Right between the kind of the stuff that was very low end, uh, you know, just kind of like Apple's photos or Google photos. And then the high end stuff like Photoshop or Lightroom, it just was in the right place. Perfect. Stored your photos on the web. Then Google bought it. Sigh. Google eliminated the paid product, made it free, and then eliminated the free product because they weren't making any money. They sure. said, they said they said they shut down Picasso Web, the web storage, said just use Google Photos. And they said, and over time we'll incorporate the features of Picasso Web into Google Photos, but I guess they never got around to that. So Monument is an interesting uh I've been watching it with uh, great interest 
because the uh, it's really a hardware solution with a with a kind of software Picasso likes software back end. You know, you, you the idea is you store your photos locally. And uh, it is even available on some network attached uh, storage devices like I believe I think my my uh, my Synology NAS uh, has Monument as well. But it's always ner I'm always nervous when I see uh, Kickstarter because, uh, you know, you can give them money, but there's no guarantee you're going to get anything for it. Mm -hmm. So did you order a Monument? I'm, I, I'm just curious. So, so well, and what I did is I, I did some research. Um, the Monument, I actually, I, I bought a used one off eBay. Smart. And it, it was only 20 bucks. And and so then you put your own. That's suspicious. It. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, and it's 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 very smart. You put two um, hard drives in it. So nice. Got a couple Western Digitals in very it. Very good. Gigabytes, so that yeah. so it does them as a RAID format. And and I mean, it almost seems a little too good to be true. But I didn't know. I said, you know what? I said I've never called in. I've been dying to call and see is there is there another solution? When I when I bought the monument. Um, like I said, because they were selling about twenty bucks a piece, I bought a second one just in case the first one, you know. Had Are you still using it? Does it work? Yeah, so it's, I've got I've got ninety thousand photos stored on it, and it uh, it eliminates my duplicates. Um, I think it's fine. Duplicate. You know, they they have an, a second project monument too, so right. they're around. Uh, they've raised a million bucks to make the monument too, so they're around. Uh, the nice thing about it is it doesn't require their participation, I think. So if the if they disappeared, you you have the monument. And unless it somehow phones home, you know, for some reason, it should continue to work. You'll always have your storage on there. So you're not going to you're not sacrificing. You know, it's not a risk, in other words. Sure. Well, and, and then I've, I've like some, been just playing around with it. I was able to take one of the hard drives and plug it right in and it and it has all my photos on their catalog nice and neat but i guess i was just um you know i said you for know, the price it, you, can, the you can't beat it for the price now i don't use it i use a network attached storage i was talking about that with our last caller it's a company called synology but it's thousands of dollars um yeah. it, it had you 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 buy an enclosure that runs a linux operating system and has you know, specialized software on top of it. It goes on your network. It's basically a computer without a keyboard, mouse, or monitor. You just connect to it via a browser, kind of like the Monument. Uh, and it does pretty much exactly what the Monument does. It'll automatically suck photos off of my computers or my phones, right. store them, organize them. It has its own software, very similar to Monument, that will do a lot of that. Uh, the advantage of both of these things is that you are hosting the photos. You're not putting them right. on a third-party service. And so for some people, for privacy reasons and so forth, they prefer that. Uh, of course, the advantage of having Google or Apple manage your photos is they're professionals. In theory, they're going to do a better job of securing it. But there's always the risk they might tire of it or you'll lose access to your account. And uh, this way, you don't have to worry about that. It's more expensive and more complicated to yourself. This monument seems like a pretty good idea. They charge a hundred bucks for it. You got it for twenty, makes it even yeah. more, you know, interesting. As long as, and I would test this, you can take that drive off the monument, plug it into your computer, and still see the photos. And 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 I did that, and it did work. Okay. You know, and then the, the, but the other challenge now has been trying to. Get uh, I, I found them was it is it called takeaway from Google where you can take, take out yeah take out yeah and then, but you try to do it with iCloud and like they only let you take a hundred photos at a time and uh, it, it, it's it's better to it ways? is better to have your stuff stored on your own storage uh, I yeah. really think there are you know there are lots of ways to do this you're not uh, you know for instance there's an open source project called NextCloud in fact for all I know that's what Monument's using I, I, I would bet you they're using something like that NextCloud is uh, kind of a Dropbox that you own so you put it on your own hardware you really? could, yeah you could run it on Raspberry Pi a uh, variety of uh, hardware will do that you could actually run it on your uh, uh, on a NAS if you wanted to so there depends on how nerdy you want to get um, and so you said next cloud next cloud yeah it's at okay. next n e x t c l o u d uh dot com and uh it's free and open source which i which i like 
So all right, well, I've, I, I will I will definitely uh, Google that and check it out. That that sounds sounds interesting. Basically, it's a run your own Dropbox is the idea. Gotcha. There are yeah, lots I of solutions. Of Western, I bought one of the Western Digital Systems um, and bought it off their website as a refurb, and it's 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 a nice piece of hardware, but you know it's it's definitely it's going all through their server, and and then they definitely want to you know let you share information with them and. I'm I'm with you though. I like the next cloud concept. That sounds yeah. like a good way to check it out. Yeah, do it. if if you're one of those people who says I don't want to trust Google or Apple to to hold all my photos, I want to do it myself. Uh, I think next cloud or a NAS uh, is probably the best way to go. It's not the easiest or the cheapest, but you control it, and that's I nice. sounds like something important to you. So, and I can understand that. You know, I I do. Um, there are other solutions as well. We could talk about them, but we got to take a break because Rod Pyle Space Guy is coming up next. Yeah, Sync Thing is different. I actually use Sync Thing and I love Sync Thing. But Sync Thing doesn't have any centralized storage, which Nextcloud does. Sync Thing synchronizes. Uh, it, for me, it's perfect, and Steve Gibson recently discovered it, and he loves it too. The idea is, I have, I don't, I wouldn't use it for photos. I well, I do, but I. <laughs> uh, that's an off. You know, if you have a lot of data, that's an awful lot of data. But Sync Thing is an open source synchronizing program that runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. I have it running on everything, and I synchronize all of my documents in my documents folder. So every machine has the same copy. Change it on one machine, it's changed on all of them. So it's more like file synchronization. There's no central store, although I do run Sync Thing on my uh, Synology, so I consider that the central store. So I do like Sync Thing, but it's not quite the same thing, COVID immune. Not quite the same thing. I think Sync Thing is pretty amazing, yeah. For a big fan of Sync Thing. I've been using it for a while. We'll have more of the tech in just a second, but I want to talk to you about Audible. I love my audiobooks from Audible. I love them so much I've been a member for 21 years now. Wow. It started when I had a long commute. Don't have that anymore, but I still listen to audiobooks all the time. Audiobooks from Audible are great because but it's not just audiobooks. It's audio entertainment. I find it hard to read even when I can. I'm tired. I fall asleep. So I listen to audiobooks when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm taking a walk. My favorite thing now is when I'm playing my video game, I listen to an audiobook. The uh, Discord chat room recommended the Robert Jordan series, the Wheel of Time series. And I've just started. In fact, let me show you because I have to say, I'm. Re By the way, guys, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, let, me, let me log into my Audible account so I can show you. Highly recommended, it, but it's just one of many things. I just finished um, Barack Obama's Good Promised Land, gets him through his first term. Uh, this is the one I'm reading right now. It's The Eye of the World, a great fantasy series. And this is, by the way, one of the things I love about Audible is reading big, long series. And each one's fairly long. So there is a lot of listening ahead. And that's what I love about Audible. Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. If you like fantasy, let me tell you, Audible's got something for everybody. Uh, in fact, now with Audible Plus, you get full access to their popular Plus catalog, which means a chance to listen and discover to new favorites, explore new formats like the Words Plus Music series. The Audible Plus catalog is fantastic, and uh, you can listen to thousands and thousands of them, add free versions of your favorite podcasts, exclusive series. There's, there's even theatrical performances. Uh, there, it, it's, look at this. This is, this is great stuff. I just love this. Ah, ah, Audible. Wow. See, this is the problem is I just, <laughs> I love Audible so much. Oh, I did download this, the new 1984 by Simon Preble. He's one of my favorite readers. That's on Audible Plus. Uh, I can go on and on. In fact, I probably will. I don't want to bore you, though. Look it. Just do me a favor. Check out Audible and Audible Plus. To use your Audible membership, you'll download the Audible app on your iPhone or Android device. You can also install it on tablets. I can listen on the web now. I just love Audible. It'll make you feel inspired, connected. It will entertain you. It'll uh, celebrity memoirs, bestsellers, mysteries. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, I just read one from, uh, this is another recommendation from the chat room. I get a lot of audiobooks in the chat room. A guy named Amor Tolles, T-O-W-L-E-S, that I loved, called G A Gentleman in Moscow. Highly recommended. Really fun. Look it. I can go on and on. I won't. What are you waiting for? Delve into your next title on Audible with Audible Plus. New members can try Audible Plus free for 30 days. Just download the Audible app. You'll get the free trial at audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash tech guy. Or text tech guy to 500, 500 I know you've heard me talk about Audible for years now. I tell everybody I know I love them. You will love it too. If you're not a member yet, A-U-D-I-B-L-E, audible.com slash tech guy for your free trial. Or you can text tech guy, one word, T-E-C-H-G-U-Y, to 500, 500 That's their short code. And you can start your free trial today. I love Audible. You will love Audible. Audible. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time to talk to our spaceman, our rocket man, Rod Pyle. Talks about space every week on the show. He is the author of a number of books about space, including Space 2.0 and uh, the editor in chief of Ad Astro, which is the official magazine of the National Space Society uh, at space.nss.org. Thank you for the latest issue, the Living in Space issue. This is this is the one uh, that you did that uh, that uh, event on, right? On living in space. Yeah, I mean, this is a lot of the same kind of topics, but different specific stuff. I just really wanted, since we we're doing a special issue, and I had managed to to beg, borrow, and steal my way up to 100 pages. I wanted to do something that was sort of central to that's what awesome the society is all about, which is living in space. So yeah, that, that's this what would did. be a great gift for a kid. To get them dreaming about the stars, you know, we got to get the younger generation excited about this because they're the next, you know, engineers, scientists, yeah. <laughs> and uh, moon men, and we want to get them excited about it. So, National Space Society, space. Well, NSS. and they either get it from this magazine or from watching Elon on Saturday Night Live. Now right? that was not inspiring. <laughs> Unless you held Dogecoin, and even then, it was probably not a good thing. No, because you know what? It went from seventy just before the show. Seventy to, cents, uh, yeah. You know, well, seventy cents, yeah, down to like twenty, it plummeted uh, me, thirty-eight. Because yeah. he said, "What did he say? It was all a scam." Right, and I might Thanks. have known somebody that bought a few Dogecoin Thanks. before. Oh, that show. really? <laughs> I got a text yeah. from my daughter on Friday. Yes, saying, "How do I get some Dogecoin?" Don't do it, honey. I said, I did. I literally said, you don't want to buy now at the peak. Why would yeah. you want to buy it now? She says, hi, how do I buy Doge on Android? Then I said, now is not the time to buy it. It's an all-time high. And, of course, it plummeted the next day. So uh -huh. dad finally got something right. Well, I like to think it's a buy and hold strategy. So, hey, <laughs> hey. the rocket came back. Thank goodness. The rocket came back. We're, you're talking and about the Chinese safely? rocket. Now, I am. Um, it, we had this problem in the 70s with Space Lab. And Sky I remember, Lab. Sky yeah. Lab. I remember what a big yeah. deal it was. Sky Lab, which was in Earth orbit, the orbits decay. Uh, they, uh, that happens. It's natural. And they, and they fall to Earth, usually burning up most of them. But we knew Sky Lab was so big that some of it would make it probably back to the Earth. And there was some concern about it. Uh, did we learn a lesson? Because it hasn't happened since. Well, so there's a popular conception that, that they just hadn't thought about it, that, that somebody hadn't sat down, scratched their head, and said, hey, what happens if this thing's come back? So Skylab was, was functioning properly up through the uh, visitation of its last crew in the mid-'70s. And then they closed it up, but they basically, basically mothballed it because they weren't going to use any more Apollo rockets and capsules to get up there, but they hoped to visit it and use it with the space shuttle. So put it in mothballs, sealed it up, left behind some supplies, came back, that last crew. I think that was 84, uh, 74. Yeah, 74. And then intended to go back. Well, the shuttle got delayed, and uh, Skylab started to come lower in its orbit. But the real problem there was there was a really active sun cycle for a couple of years, and our the Earth's atmosphere expanded and started clawing at the lab and it began to get dragged down. So we weren't able to get up there and move it into a higher orbit in time. But that was always the plan. So that's why it was an accidental reentry. So it was an oopsie. It, it was but an oopsie, did, but but it had been thought out. And so you got to give them kudos for okay. that. Okay. And so we're, we're, we're pretty careful as a nation, as a space-faring nation, not to have yeah. debris fall from the sky, right? Yeah, and really most people are. So, so What happened with asked, China? 
<laughs> well, and, and we all signed this instrument in the 60s and 70s called the Outer Space Treaty that says, hey, you fly it up there, you own it, you break it, you bought it when it comes back. Yeah. So what's puzzling about this is um, what's been happening. Most countries, when they uh, boost something heavy into orbit like that, uh, they put the 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 rocket booster itself, the stage on this kind of suborbital trajectory so that you lob the payload ahead of you and then the booster re-enters predictably, usually into the Pacific Ocean. For some oh, so reason, you can actually tell where it's going to land, and you can oh, yeah. and you can make sure it lands in the ocean, which is yeah. after all two thirds of the surface, and so right, okay. and that's why. So what you know, did the Chinese they, not figure that out, or what happened? Well, it's it's not really clear. So they're a signatory to this treaty, which means any damage caused by returning debris is going to be their problem, and they've agreed to that. Not reassuring so, if it hits your house and you're in no. it. <laughs> but um, so it's unclear why you would on purpose let this thing go up into orbit and an unstable orbit at that and to make matters worse uh we're in kind of a you know twitchy piece of the solar cycle right now so the amount of the the density of the atmosphere up there is varying depending on how much energy the sun's putting out in any given day so that makes it very hard to predict where it's going to come back and that's why u.s space command and the others were tracking it very carefully so we're lucky it came down uh, looks like it it re-entered over the arabian peninsula and broke up over the maldives the indian ocean as far as they know nobody was was hurt or affected but haven't got all the reports back the yet. Chinese, it's a big piece of hardware. It's 100 Chinese feet long. The Chinese statement was a little tone deaf. They said, well, yeah. it happens you know, every day. It's mostly water. It probably isn't going to hit anybody. But this, they did the yeah. same thing last year, too. Yes. Are they yes. being, is this them being um, irresponsible oh. or what? Well, maybe a little cavalier. It's hard to say. Um, I think part of it might just be the damn the horse torpedoes full speed ahead kind of mentality of the program they really wanted to get this station module up so this rocket launch we're talking about they're trying to build their own uh space station yeah so this was the first module of that the the largest most challenging one to get up there and then there will be two more that hook into it and maybe more beyond that but that's what we know of so far is there will be three so you know it's a fast track program and there may not have been all the homework done, the I's dotted and the T's crossed. But, yeah, this is a pattern, and it's something that the international community is going to have to address. Is it hard? I is see... it something that is a hard thing to do? No. <laughs> That's no, puzzling just have to the me. plan. Because we've to... been doing it for 60-plus years now. So there really isn't and an excuse like, oh, this is an expensive or difficult or... No. No. No, it's just planning ahead. Now, there may have been... There may be something I don't know about some vagary of the particular orbital placement they were doing, but I don't think so because in most cases, other heavy payloads, you know, the booster's done the same thing. It's come back predictably. I see a Discord. Somebody mentioned that SpaceX rained debris all over Seattle. Who was that? Kem Chilelystra? I can't pronounce that name. But that was a little different. That's a very small object. This thing's 100 feet long and 23 tons, so it's smaller than Skylab. By about two thirds. Yeah, but even but if, it's still a big piece of hardware. Chunk, if, if a chunk goes through my car roof, even if it's a small chunk, it's not going to be a happy day. And yeah, if it so hits somebody in the head, which is again, I understand statistically yeah. highly unlikely, but you should, if it's not hard to to <laughs> to avoid it, you should avoid yeah. it. Well, and user tip for us Earthlings, if you see a bright light in the sky that's getting brighter and brighter, but run. Not moving side to side, <laughs> run really fast, because that's going to be a very bad I've thing. I've seen enough Bruce Willis movies to know that much anyway. Um, I wanted to mention something else. Yes. If, if I could. got a minute. Yep. Yeah, I was listening to your show yesterday, uh -oh. and you had a gentleman that was uh, fiddling with his Apple TV because he was he was getting interference from the people next door with the Apple neighbors. TV, and you said, yeah. put something metal around it. Which reminded me of the Voyager spacecraft that went out to reconnoiter the outer planets in the late 70s and the 80s. And they had, the, the, uh, there's a very nice gentleman named John Cassani who I've interviewed for many hours who was managing that program. And he said, you know, we thought about the radiation out there in electronics, so we made little metal hats for all the transistors. <laughs> but it wasn't until the last minute that somebody ran in my office and said, oh my God, the radiation is going to cause current spikes in all the cables and we're going to get these current surges coming into the system and it's going to burn out the aye, circuit board. Aye, aye, so aye. they literally went down to Safeway, bought Reynolds Wrap, and wrapped all their wires in kitchen foil, and it worked. It worked. 
So that is a cost-effective government solution, if ever I've heard and one, don't you, you think? If you can't get to Safeway, don't forget chewing gum wrappers also have foil in them. If you <laughs> That's true, but paper. you need an awful lot of them. <laughs> That's right? very MacGyver. Thank you, yeah. Rod Pyle. Thanks, sir. Space.nss.org. We'll see you again next week. Leo Laporte. Take care. The Tech Guy. <laughs> That's hysterical. We got a question for you from our space guy, John. You're John? Yeah, hold on a second. We got, they used to use this, you can't hear him, so I'm going to have to relay. They, okay. they used to use the shuttle to boost the ISS. Go ahead. Are they going to keep boosting ISS up into a higher orbits, or will it eventually fall in, into the atmosphere? No, they boost it with the Russian module. But they do continually boost it. But will yeah. they do that forever, or at some point will well, we and it, lose interest? At this point, we were going to shut it down in 2024, then it was 2028, now it might be 2030. They're still scratching their heads over that. The problem is the Russians want to take their toys and go home, right. and they have that main have power and propulsion module. Yeah, Russians, right. Yeah. So we'd have to replace that, but uh, NASA's trying to get private industry interested to come up and pick up some of the weight by running experiments and doing but manufacturing up there. So th forth. If I'm correct, in, in underst if I understand you... When the time comes to decommission ISS, they can do it in such a way that it will land in an ocean. Yeah, they can pick exactly where they want it to go. And it, and that's pretty reliable, you know. I mean, there are some vagaries because you never know exactly how those things are going to tumble when they start coming in, when they're going to start tumbling, you know, what atmospheric density causes something to catch aerodynamically yeah. and start it spinning. It, but certainly in general won't terms, build, it certainly won't burn up. It's too big to burn up. So well, it's, some it's big, big, but chunks, it's very lightly built. Oh, it's big, but it's light. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's there's stuff there that is that is heavy and dense, but you know you can you can pull it apart and and bring it down in littler pieces too. So just make sure those things burn up, and oh. there's nothing, no no major radioactive masses or anything. That's like that. the other thing is, yeah, about. we have. Do we have any satellites with reactors in them? They well, one re. Uh, uh, I was going to mention a a Russian satellite, Soviet satellite, re-entered over Canada in 1978 that was had a nuclear reactor on it, and it scattered all over the Canadian Arctic. And due to that agreement I was talking about, the Outer Space Treaty, the USSR paid three million dollars Canadian at the time, which I guess was a lot of money back then. It's about two million U.S. at the time for cleanup. Um, but uh, I don't remember if there's any decommissioned. Re I think there might still be a de decommissioned reactor up there. But there's so much stuff. I mean, if you look at an animation of how much there, how much material, large chunks are orbiting in these different orbital shells, it's really chilling. It's amazing they can launch through all that junk. But they we can. were talking about that the other day. You, yesterday, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. it's it's so how you, hard it is to get through you there. You can. There are maps. You know where they are, and you can you can plan a. A path that well, would avoid it. There's charts, yeah. I mean, I, maps, charts. I mean, the Air Force and others track all this, this stuff. Radar. But it's constantly changing, of course. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to really think ahead and calculate very, very, uh, very carefully. D to his credit, you know, a lot of people are bashing on Starlink, but you know, those Starlink satellites have AI in them to do avoidance and correction. So right. they actually are set up to do that, as long as it works, of course. <laughs> Hope it works better than uh, Tesla's self-driving vehicles. <laughs> what a story that was. Wow. Yeah, that was sad, those guys. Yeah. I yeah. mean. I, what a way to go, though. Flying down the highway into a tree. <laughs> oh, but into the back seat. You know? So I dumb. Mean, come on. So yeah. dumb. What were they eating, uh, drinking, or eating? Oh, boy. All right, Rod. Have a great week. Thank you once again. Thanks, sir. Awesome. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. For let me be myself again. Thank you so much for letting me be your tech guy today. Thanks to Professor Laura, our musical director, for spinning the discs for Mother's Day, some great mother music. Kim Shafford made some recommendations, by the way. Thank you for those. And of course, she's our phone angel answering the phones. And most of all, thanks to all of you who call and all of you who listen. You also serve who merely sit and listen. I appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Last segment of the hour, last hour of the day. Nick, last day of the weekend. Nick in San Diego, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Nick. Hey, Leo. Welcome. Glad to get through to you, friend. Thank you, thank you. Um, hey, uh, I don't know if you could help me here, but uh, I would say for the last three or four months, my computer has just been dragging 
uh, going from web page to web page or from a link in, in an email account to a web page. Okay, I'll go to the next page if you <laughs> insist. <laughs> but I won't enjoy it. Yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah, how old is it? Appreciate it. Um, it's a, it, well, it's, a, it's an Intel i5, Windows 10. Um, it's got 8 gigabyte of RAM. I barely keep anything on the hard drive. Yeah, no, it's it sounds like it'd be powerful enough. How, is it five years old? Um, close to it, yeah. yeah. So there are a number of things that can slow a computer down to molasses. Uh, almost always, it's the spinning hard drive inside. These things uh, get fragmented. They uh, they get more 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 importantly because Windows does a pretty good job of keeping them organized they also just get harder to read and all it takes is a few locations that you need to read frequently to really slow you down the way the operating system works is it will if it can't read it right away it'll try again for a few times eventually get the data move on another one oh it'll try again and again and that really shows up as slowness the processor doesn't slow down the ram doesn't slow down it's the hard drive. Uh, so there are a couple of things you can do. Generally, the best recommendation I can make for an older computer is to take the spinning drive out and replace it with a solid-state drive. That's a fairly inexpensive... Is it a laptop or a desktop? Oh, it's a laptop. Laptop. So some laptops, it's an easy thing to do. The the, the drive bay is, is... You just take off the back and it's right there. Some laptops, it's buried deep within. You can look online uh, and just, you know, Google, uh, you know, upgrade hard drive in my mod and you have a specific model it'll and you'll find a video of somebody doing it you can decide how hard that is but for a hundred bucks you could put another hard drive in there that would definitely make all the difference in the world sometimes it's just enough to reinstall windows to to back up your data wipe the drive reinstall windows that will solve the problem if what's slowing you down is malware or just kind of flaky bits of Windows, that kind of thing. So you might try that first. It's a little, you know, pain because you got to back up your data. But the good news is, if it doesn't work, now you're all set to get a new drive in there, reinstall Windows, and restore your data. But either one of those should make a massive difference. It's not the it's not the hardware. In other words, it's it's either the drive or what's on the drive. So what what fixes it sometimes is I call I close down my Gmail account on one of the tabs or I have to clear cache and uh, get oh that's interesting so it's only in browsers that this happens everything else is running okay yeah good, I should have paid closer attention you did say it's browsing yeah. um yeah that's interesting um, i five five years old less than eight gigs of RAM it's a little bit low on the RAM you're using Chrome. Chrome is a notoriously heavy-duty browser. Yeah. You might I really like Microsoft's Edge browser. It's based on the same engine as Chrome, the Chromium engine, but uh, it's a little lighter weight, a little faster. You might just see if Edge uh, is better. If it performs fine, then really, then maybe you should replace Chrome. However, Chrome might just be the symptom of this hard drive failure. You know, that it might just be that that's where you see it most. So I'm not saying it doesn't mean it's your hard drive. But yeah, you might first try to run Microsoft Edge. You should have it. Uh, all, all versions of Windows 10 will have it if they don't already. So uh, try Edge. I think it's pretty snappy. It's a great browser. And because it's based on Chrome, it will work on all the sites your Chrome works fine on. It'll even use your Chrome extensions and all of that. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah. Well, I, hey, I appreciate you being on the radio and helping us non-geek people. And uh, well, that's a pain. And Nick, you shouldn't have to suffer with that. We do, you know, we do, don't we? I mean, we 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 put up with this stuff with technology. It's death by a million cuts, slowly, inch by inch. Everything doesn't work quite as well, and pretty soon you realize I'm not having any fun at all. So it's worth it's worth paying attention to it and fixing it. Don't suffer. No more suffering. Well, if you think about the future with the population getting older and older and technology getting more advanced and all of our lives now being confined to the Internet, I have uh, bad feelings about what's going to happen to the older generation uh, in another 10 years where they won't even be able to, to get money out of a bank. or. You know, all, it, all it showed up with uh, COVID vaccinations that the people yeah. who needed it most were least able to use the online sites the states had set up. And it was a big problem. 
Uh, so I agree with you. Uh, and it, it does argue for keeping up as best you can so that uh, you don't get left out as you get older and older. Yeah, it's going to be hard to do. It is. And we got to help and we got to help each other. Right, right. Thanks, well, Nick. I appreciate your help, sir. Take All right. Care. Have a great day. Take care. Steve, I think you'll be our last caller from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hello, Steve. Well, hello. It's such a privilege to be able to uh, join your show today. Well, thank you so much for calling. I appreciate it. Well, um, I heard you speak about the Signology um, NAS units, and I have a, a couple quick questions. Okay. Uh, um I have had a, a I had an older or I still have an older DS410 unit and um I understand it's got some security issues now. Oh, that's too update. bad. Yeah. And so um I just purchased a new um DS720 plus and I was just wondering what is the best way to transfer my data from the hard drives of my older unit to this one as far as um can I just take them out of the old unit and put them in this one, or does it have to Probably have to not. I mean, it is Synology, but remember, Synology uses uh, RAID, so those drives aren't just right. plain drives. The data is spread across the drives. Uh, that, that, that 410 is so old, I don't know if it's using the same technology. It might be. That's something worth looking into. There are a couple of other ways to do this. You can connect both you know, I, Synologies have USB ports, so you could connect both to a computer and copy. There's also a program I use from uh, Synology called Hyperdrive. It's free. It's part of the Synology uh, application suite. And it will automatically synchronize to Synologies. So I keep my old one at work, my new Synologies at home, and I use Hyperdrive and the old one calls the new one, downloads any changes, and keeps... So I essentially have a mirror of my Synology at work, which is, I think, another way to do it. So instead of getting rid of the 410, um, of course, it, it isn't secure anymore. So make sure it's not on the... Yeah, this is a problem because you wanted to use the internet for this backup. So maybe this isn't such a great idea. But you could at least use HyperDrive within your home network at first. Uh, to do that, and uh, that would synchronize them as well. It's a little slower because doing it in the background. So there are a number of ways I, to do that. You might, you know, if you don't care, if you've got all the data backed up, you might try putting the drives in the new Synology, but my worry, my fear is it might destroy the data on those drives. And so only do it if you've got yeah. a good backup of everything. I do love Synologies, but it is true with all hardware, eventually they stop supporting it. I'm sorry to hear that 410 is no longer in support. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Let me see how to migrate. We're going to, Retcon has found an uh, article on the Synology knowledge base on how you can do the migration from one to the other. So maybe possible you can do that. Yeah, they call it migration. Okay. Um, so, yeah, do a Google for uh, Synology Knowledge Base. How do I migrate data? And uh, okay. it looks, and it, they actually say use hyper backup. So there you go. Um, but there, it looks like it might be you might be able to direct connect them, which would be great oh, because that'd be faster. Yeah. Well, I know the the old one also has a. Uh, well, no, they they both have USB, but I don't know how old the USB. You know, it wouldn't be super fast. It'd probably be two point oh, so it'd be kind of slow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It looks yeah, hyper they recommend using hyper drive hyper backup. So that's that's what I was suggesting. That will give you a mirror copy of the one onto the other. So that's the mo that's gonna okay. give you. And I certainly don't so, don't me, destroy the four ten, keep it around in case. So I could actually um instead of setting up the new one with uh in raid, I could maybe just uh keep the old one connected. And um, use it as a rate? Sure. You could keep the old one connected as long as you make sure it's not on the public Internet because of those security yeah. risks. Right. But as long as it's okay. not on the public Internet, the new one can be. It's secure. Uh, I think uh -huh. you'd be all right. Uh, you wouldn't be okay. able to use the two of them together as a RAID 
No. Right. But but you could get one to data off of the 410 over to the new one, for sure. So when I set up the new one, I, I, do I need to put it in a RAID? Yeah, it's always in a RAID. That's just the way they work. You won't. Okay. You won't. Have, you want RAID because otherwise you got multiple uh, disks that are independent. So yeah, you're gonna. Okay. You have a variety of choices, but you're gonna definitely use one of their uh, RAID systems because it's a multi. How many? How many? The seven. The new seven twenty. How many drives is it? Seven. No, it's only two. It's two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be in RAID anyway, though. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you have a choice what, about that. Is there a particular RAID you like to use better than others? I can't remember what I use on this. I like RAID 5, but I think Synology has its own special uh, right. system. That's what I use. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um but I use whatever the Synology, whatever Synology says is, this is the one, this is the best one. This is the one we invented. <laughs> That's what I use. <laughs> S SHR. Is that it? SHR? It's basically RAID 5. Okay. That's yeah. What yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've been using. Yeah. On the old one, yeah. I yeah, I think, yes, probably, yeah. Yeah, I think you're smart to stick with Synology. I think they're a great company. I think you're, 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 uh, you're in good hands. Well, I'm I'm a professional photographer, like you said. Oh yeah, see, see, can't lose those photos. <laughs> yeah, but now I'm semi-retired, so I don't I don't have to put as much into it anymore like I used yeah, to. No bridezilla's coming after you for losing the wedding pictures, huh? Thank God. <laughs> oh my God, that would be a nightmare. Pleasure to meet you, yeah, Steve. Great talking with you. I enjoy your show. Oh, thank you so much. Have a great day. Keep Take care. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I'll try. I don't know how good it is, but I'll keep doing it. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon. This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.